Good morning uh, and welcome to the first meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee and I wish all members of the committee and indeed everyone who the panellists are in the room a happy new year. And I can just remind everyone as I usually do to put their mobile phones into a process that won't disturb proceedings. Thank you. Uh, the first item on our agenda this morning is to decide whether to take a draft report on the Scottish Government's budget for 2019 20 in private at future meetings. Are members agreed? agreed? Members are agreed. Thank you. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's budget for 2019 20 from the Scottish Fiscal Commission and then from the Office of Budget Responsibility. And we're joined for our first session this morning by Dame Susan Rice, who's the chairperson of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, John Ireland, who's the chief executive, and Commissioners Professor Alistair Smith. We're also joined for the first time as commissioners by Professor Francis Breeden and Professor David Ulf. And we look forward to working with you in your new role, not only today, but in the future. Uh, I welcome you all to the meeting and I would invite Dame Susan Rice to make a, an opening statement. Thank you very much. Convener, you have just taken my first three sentences of my opening statement, which was to wish all of you uh, good wishes for a healthy and prosperous new year uh, and to introduce my colleagues. But we're very pleased to be here this morning. Thank you for having us. Um, this is the Commission's third forecast report since we became a statutory body, our, our second budget forecast. Uh, as before, we give an, out, an economic outlook for the next five years and forecast devolved tax receipts and Social Security spending. But I want to mention just a few points where we have added or enhanced uh, what we're putting in this report. We've also expanded our focus on the fiscal consequences of our forecasts and the block grant adjustments as the fiscal framework matures and as we start to get a better sense of the likely scale of reconciliations, particularly for income tax. So to start, the economic outlook for Scotland for to over 2018-19 has improved since our last forecast in May, and the latest forecast reflects several things. That improvement reflects recent stronger economic performance in Scotland, a more positive prospect for earnings over the next couple of years, and the increased public spending that was announced in the UK autumn budget. So a stronger economic performance over the next two years, but after that we forecast an outlook that's more subdued, uh, with annual economic growth expected to settle back to around 1% again. As in our previous forecast, this longer term outlook reflects continued low productivity growth compared with trends before the 2008 financial crisis. At the same time, we still anticipate that productivity growth will gently start to recover in the later years of our forecast. Now, Brexit was front of mind uh, as we did our work, and, has, and has, it has been uh, throughout our various forecasts in the past. Our economy forecast was prepared on the central assumption that the UK's exit from the EU is relatively smooth or orderly, to use the technical term. This assumption encompasses a number of different possible scenarios. There isn't an orderly exit, but that could happen in a number of ways. But a no-deal Brexit is considered in our forecast to be a downside risk to the forecast and not factored into it, although probably a somewhat increasing risk. Our formal judgment was based on what we knew up to late November when our economy forecasts closed. And since then, as we've had no clearer idea of what's actually going to happen, we kept an orderly exit central to our forecast. And as I say, that could reflect any of a range of scenarios. And even if there is a disorderly exit, specific detail around that would also need to be developed in order to uh, forecast it. So none of these are overnight changes. As it turns out, this approach mirrors the one taken by the OBR and its UK budget forecasts in the autumn, uh, which were published shortly before ours. And although we came to these conclusions separately, there are advantages in having the UK and Scottish budget tax forecasts prepared in a similar view of the UK-EU negotiations. Moving on, our tax and social security forecasts now play a greater role in the budget arithmetic. 
as more taxes and benefits are devolved. In total, we're forecasting 15.2 billion pounds will be raised by devolved taxes in 1920. That's just over a third of the government's budget. Our forecasts show how the Scottish government's policy choices are affecting the Scottish budget. Income tax, land and buildings transaction tax are both raising additional revenue as a result of changes announced in the budget, while receipts from non-domestic rates were lower. Taxpayers inevitably respond to the incentives implicit in the tax system, and estimating the impact and scale of behavioral change is an important part of our work. In last year's forecast, we included an adjustment for behavioral responses to the introduction of the new five-band income tax. In this forecast, we've looked at the behavioral response to the freezing of the higher rate threshold. While it's important to consider these effects, however, the magnitude is small. We reduced our income tax forecast by £13 million as a result of behavioural responses to the UK tax system. That's about 0.1% of the £11.7 billion um, forecast for income tax revenue. Social Security features again in our report, with new and expanded benefits in Scotland bringing total spending on Social Security to £458 million in 1920. As benefits have been devolved, the Scottish Government has introduced reforms, extending entitlements, making it easier to apply, uh, increasing payment amounts. So in 1920, we estimate that these new and expanded Social Security payments will cost £90 million more than the funding received from the UK government for those particular programmes. The Scottish Government is due to take executive competency in April 2020 for the remaining benefits that will be worth around £2.6 billion. Social Security forecasting will become more important for the Scottish Budget as all these benefits have block grant adjustments and associated <coughs> reconciliations. I should also add that since we last gave evidence here, we've continued to work on access to the data that we need for our work on Social Security. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we've had a number of quite constructive conversations with the DWP. Agreement has been reached to allow, uh, allow us separate access to information and timely access um, that's already provided to the Scottish Government. We still have to finalize a memorandum of understanding and MOU, but the DWP is now taking our need for access to data seriously. Finally, I was pleased that yesterday Robert Choate and I signed a formal MOU between the Commission and the OBR, reflecting the strong and collegiate working relationship that we've developed over the last several years. Thank you for listening to those comments. Thank you, Liam Susan. In your introduction, you were dis discussed the behavioural responses, uh, and that's, uh, certainly that's where I want to begin the discussion this morning. I need you to help me, enable me, and perhaps some of my committee colleagues to get a better understanding of the correlation between your forecast of behavioural responses to the Scottish Government's tax policy changes and your forecast for the increase in the number of top rate and higher rate taxpayers. And can I give us some examples of what I mean by that? Inevitably, that means lots of numbers, but I guess that's part of the game we're involved in this morning. Uh, for example, in December, you forecast the number of additional uh, rate taxpayers to rise by 700 between 2016-17 and 17-18, which is a year before the rate increase to 46p. Yet between 17-18 and 18-19, which is the year when the rate increased, you forecast that the number of top rate taxpayers would increase by 900 and that it would increase by a further 900 in 18 1919 and 1920, we've seen another forecast increase of 1,200 between 1920 and 2021. So the question I have is, I need you to help me with, is how are you able to forecast a larger number, a larger increase in the number of top rate taxpayers after the increase in top in tax rate than before? Given that you also forecast a behavioural response to the tax changes, I just as there's something in there I just don't get. I'll, I'll give you a one-sentence answer and then turn to one of my colleagues to give you a little more of the of the detail. Uh, the the numbers of people in each of these bands will necessarily change um, like shifting sands uh, over time, irrespective of the. 
bands themselves, if the Scottish population grows, uh, if uh, people uh, come into certain types of jobs, if uh, earnings change, people will move category. Um, it just happens, um, uh, you know, and, and so so those changes um, will happen necessarily, uh, and the specific numbers are, are part of the forecast judgment that we bring to it. But David, do you want to? But, but um, before you yeah. do, but it's, it's also yeah. if you look at all these numbers put together, we're yeah. talking about for top rate taxpayers rising thirteen thousand three hundred more of them between sixteen and seventeen. Um, compared with 2021. So that seems to me than just more than just that sort of change that's going on. But David. Yes, there, as Susan said, there are, there are two drivers here. One is changes in the number of taxpayers who are eligible for various tax bans. So if, for example, Scotland attracted back into Scotland through migration some very high income individuals, they would go into the top tax band. So there's an increase in the number of taxpayers comes about through a variety of forces, growth in population, migration, and if, if you increase employment, that will bring people in more at the bottom end of the, of the income distribution and at the bottom tax bands. The major force that's driving up the number of taxpayers is the fact that earnings increase faster than the tax threshold. So if earnings go up faster than the tax threshold, you're sucking people from the lower tax band into the higher tax band. And because we've assumed that the top rate of tax will be frozen, the threshold will be frozen at 150,000 throughout the five years of the forecast, if, if you're sitting just below 150,000, and you have, say, 2 or 3% growth in your earnings, you will inevitably be pulled above that 150,000 threshold. For the higher rate tax band, we've assumed that the, it's frozen for 2019-20, but we've assumed that it will be uprated with inflation in the re re remaining years of the forecast. But it's still going to be the case that, given our forecast on earnings, earnings will be rising somewhat faster than inflation, so earnings will be rising faster than the higher rate threshold is going up in the later years of the forecast. So again, you have this force of pooling people who had earnings just below the tax threshold into the higher tax band. And these are quite powerful forces driving up the number of taxpayers. And it happens in any country where you have a progressive tax system you inevitably pull people up through the various tax bands as the economy grows and as their earnings grow in the economy. Now, the behavioural effects we're looking at um, of the decision to freeze the tax rate and th freeze the higher rate threshold, while the UK government has increased the th uh, threshold to 50,000, there are two components to that behavioural effect. Since you're interested in the number of taxpayers, I'll focus first of all on the, the, what we call the external uh, margin effect. So here, people above the higher rate threshold will end up paying more tax if they're in Scotland than if they're in the rest of the UK. And that will cause some taxpayers who are resident in England to consider do I want to move to Scotland? And maybe decide not to move to Scotland. But it could equally decide, affect some taxpayers who are resident in Scotland deciding that they want to move to the rest of the UK. Now, when the people move from Scotland to the, UK, the rest of the UK or move, don't move from the rest of the UK to Scotland, Scotland loses the entire tax revenue that those people get. So you don't, have, you don't need to have very many people deciding either to move from Scotland to the rest of the UK or not move from the rest of the UK to Scotland to have quite a big impact on tax revenues. Now, as Susan said, we're forecasting around £6 million of lost tax revenue because of those behavioural effects. But that can come about through a relatively small number 
of taxpayers either deciding to move south or not to move north. Yeah, and both of those effects are included there. Now, the increase in the number of taxpayers is only relevant to the taxpayers who are in Scotland. So it's only that effect that will be picked up when we're looking at uh, the number of taxpayers. The fact that somebody chooses not to move to Scotland is not going to affect the number of taxpayers in Scotland, but it will affect the loss of, the loss of tax revenue. So there are, there are different effects working in terms of the behavioural effects, which won't necessarily affect the number of taxpayers. Uh, still, the number, the, the number of the issue for me is, how are you able to forecast a larger increase in the number of tax rate payers after the increase in the tax rate than before? That's... And, and I understand all the things you, you, you've described there, but, so, but it's that bit that I don't get. I think the thing is, is that it is simply with a stronger earnings uh, profile. You know, the, the, the fact that Dave talks about about people migrating from one band to the other is is stronger. With a, with a, so that in a sense, the earnings profile is already it, it necessarily generates a bigger transition from into the higher rate band. So it's just down to the, the not the just level to of that, but that's growth. that's one of the important effects. Yeah. It's just the fact that the numbers are different. You, there'll be a large number of people hold above the the threshold because of that effect, the increase in earnings, then will be affected by the behavioural changes. As I say, you you don't need to have very many people choosing to move south because of the higher taxes they pay in Scotland to have a big impact on tax revenue. Because you lose their entire tax revenue. Yeah. Okay, and, and just some final questions from me. I know there's others who, who want to get in on this. That's one side of the equation, is the, the tax um, issue. But in terms of the assumptions you made in the analysis you carried out, what analysis was undertaken of the flip side of this in terms of issues like free tuition, um, issues like free um, care for the elderly, etc., in terms of your analysis of that process? Okay, the, the way this analysis is done is the following. That if you have people located on, on two sides of a border uh, in, in the rest of the UK and in Scotland, there will be some people in the rest of the UK who are very committed to being in the rest of the UK for family reasons, for employment reasons, and so on, and almost would never move. Equally, there will be people in Scotland who have a, a great attachment to being in Scotland it would take an awful lot to get them to ch decide to move out of Scotland. But in between those bands, there'll be lots of people who will be a, a, a number of people for whom being in Scotland or being in the rest of the UK, there's pluses and minuses on both sides of that. They see some attractions to being in Scotland, they see some attractions to being in the rest of the UK. So these are the people who are mobile. These are the people who relatively small changes in tax rates could cause them to move from one side of the border to the other. The fact that they have seen some attractions of being in Scotland doesn't mean that they won't move because they may see other attractions of being in yeah, the rest of the UK. But, in, in your, but, in the, but the bottom line is, in your analysis, it was about the tax issue only. It didn't include yeah. issues to do with the benefits you get from being in Scotland, yeah. such as free tuition, free care for the elderly. Yeah. But those haven't changed. Those are, the, okay. We've had free tuition for years. Those haven't changed. Right. So those those factors are not going to change people's decision okay. to move. The only thing that's changed is the tax change. So that's what we look at when we're factoring in the, the, the behavioural effects. Okay, understand. Alex. Question to yeah, continuation of a convener is that you have a, despite the negative behavioural change, you have a, a number of additional tax rate payers goes up by 25% and the number of higher tax rate taxpayers goes up by 10% by the next session. Uh, now, you've, you've talked about that it's not about the migration uh, to the rest of the UK and Scotland, it, it's about people moving from one band to another. Um, you know, with, with real earnings growth, you know, whether it's 0.3% or 0.5% <coughs> over, over two years between the next session, you know, are you suggesting that you know, there are basically 5,000 uh, additional tax rate payers sitting within just below that band who are going to move up to that band? And so my question is really about how, how confident are you that, that 
that you, you can see those people <laughs> just below that band because you know the, the data within the bands you know you've got the survey of personal income you know that's only uh, a sample of I think 1.5 percent of taxpayers across the UK when that data comes to Scotland I believe that's aggregated uh, so so within each band how can you actually yeah, how are you able to predict there is that volume of people that is going to flip if the earnings predictions are correct? Um, John, do you want to...? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, you, you've hit the head pretty accurately there. So the survey of personal incomes gives us a, a, a distribution, and that gives us not only just, you know, who belongs <coughs> to which band, but where in the band they are. Now, because it's a sample survey, and also because of the composite records of the, for the additional rate, it's not perfect. But in a sense, it's given the information that we have um, at the moment from the survey of personal incomes, that's you know, as well as we can do. When we have the outturn data, of course, um, that will make things a little bit easier. We'll have more information. But at the moment, um, we have to make the judgments of where people in the band, so how likely are they move likely to move up when there's when their nominal earnings increase, we have to make that on the basis of the information that survey of personal income gives us. Okay. I think Adam's got a supplementary on this very point. Yeah, as I'm, well, just, so. I'm just trying to understand just how ro ro robust these numbers are. So we're all we're all learning here about you know the art of um, economic forecasting and what, what you know what's robust and reliable and and, and what's perhaps um, uh, more near the near the the guess end of the spectrum. And I just want to know where on that spectrum these figures fit. So. Um, specifically, what you've said in your most recent forecast um, is that the number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland will increase by about 30% um, over, the, uh, over the years between 2019 and 2023, so from 15,800 to 20,100. That's a very significant jump. That's a 30% increase. And, of course, that has massive consequences for the tax revenues that um, the Scottish Government uh, receives because of the way... Um, in which um, uh, income tax is, as it were, prioritised amongst the basket of devolved taxation. So how robust is that forecast increase of 30% additional rate taxpayers, 30% a th increase in the number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland over that four-year four, four year period? Do, do you know that there are that many people currently earning you know, £142,000 who in a few years' time will be earning £150,000 plus? Or is it nearer the... I'm not being disrespectful, but is it nearer the, the guess end of the spectrum of forecasts that you're required to make? Well, I would say that all, all the types of numbers we've been talking about, that is a re relatively robust number because we do have a fairly good idea of what the distribution of income is amongst taxpayers in Scotland through the survey of, of personal incomes. So we can use that fairly reliably predict what that, the shape of that distribution is. And the, the thing is, there's quite a lot of people sitting just below some of these thresholds. We, we, know, sorry, we know that, do we? We, we? we know for a fact that there are quite a lot of people in Scotland currently earning whatever it would be, £145,000, £140,000, who you predict within a space of four years will be earning £150,000. You, you know that. Well, it's, 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 we know it better than... It's not, it's not a guess. We right. have a pretty good idea of what the shape of the distribution of income is. Is in Scotland. Can, can, can I be a, a little bit more specific? We know that in, income distributions at the upper end characteristically have a very predictable shape, and it, it's a shape that tails off quite sharply. So as you move up the income distribution, you get fewer and fewer people. And if you think about that, what, 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 what means when the threshold doesn't move up with inflation? Mm. You have a relatively small number of people in the tail above the threshold compared with the people clustered just below the threshold. So when the threshold doesn't move with inflation, you do, as your question indicated, Mr. Tom, you get a surprisingly large number of people moving into okay. the upper tax band. But it's just a feature of the, the shape of that tail distribution with okay. quite a lot of people close to the border and a relatively thin spread of people above the threshold. That's the, and that's a pretty robust feature okay. of income distributions. So you're not surprised by this surprisingly large number of... <laughs> okay, thank you. You're a little bit surprised that we're asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick, now we'll come to... Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, could I just first of all pick up on, on some of the questions that, that Bruce Crawford was, was asking 
uh, about the balance between sort of push and pull factors, if you like, uh, comparing changes in income tax. Uh, Convener mentioned some other factors which uh, uh, Professor Olf said hadn't changed, like some of the, the, the social benefits of uh, living in Scotland. But there are other factors that will change, like the affordability of housing, compared with some parts of the UK which uh, face a, a much more severe housing crisis than, uh, than Scotland, albeit there are, there are challenges here. And as well, the decisions that people make, the behavioural changes that, that might arise, aren't just about uh, a response directly to changes in things like tax policy, but their response to what people know and what people think and feel about those things. If the Fiscal Commission isn't in a position to try and gauge a, a kind of net effect, is anybody able to produce uh, a kind of overall sense of, of how these push and pull factors might interact or cancel out? Well, the, the way we do this is the situation I described before where you have people on the side of a border who feel some attachment to one area but some attachment to another area as well. And relatively small changes can cause them to shift from one, thing mm. to one area to another. You're absolutely right. There can be a whole variety of factors that fit into that scenario. It can be family factors. It can be employment factors. It can be schooling issues. A whole range of factors can go into those decisions. It could be social, cultural, or political social, factors, cultural, like all, how all welcome migrants yeah. feel in a, yeah. in a political environment. And, and the, way we, the way we calculate this is that there are many places throughout the world where this situation arises. Think of the various states in America. You've got the same language, mm. you've got the same currency, but yet you have differences between states in schooling and other areas. Similarly, in Australia, in Germany. Now, there have been lots and lots of studies made of migration between these different states. And remember, each year, about 30 to 40,000 people are moving in both directions across the border between Scotland and England because new opportunities are arising, new factors are shifting and changing and causing people to make those moves. Mm. And that's happening throughout the world. Throughout the world, there are these moves across borders. And you can use evidence about where are those flows being affected by tax differences to try to gauge the extent to which a small change in tax mm. induces a somewhat larger flow of people across borders. And that's the kind of information we mm. use in our forecast. We use a lot of studies from many other areas which give us some sense of confidence that we have fairly well established estimates of what the percentage changes in the amount of taxable income we get in Scotland for a given percentage difference in yeah. Tax I, rates between Scotland I, I absolutely and appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm still slightly at a loss to know whether it is possible to to do that work and then to make a comparison with what the other factors uh, might cause people to do, uh, for example, changes in housing affordability. If there were studies out there which had looked specifically at housing affordability, we could draw on those studies to uh, look at the, 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 those effects. But we're really focusing on the effects of tax. Yeah changes. Yeah. And that, that has been fairly well studied, so there are lots of studies out there on which yeah. we can draw. Let, let, let me come on to that then. Uh, last year, uh, when the, the Fiscal Commission gave evidence at about the same point in the, in the budget process, I asked some of these questions, um, and in relation to uh, location issues, either where people report their location being for tax purposes, where they move to or from, or, or whether they might change their decisions in the future. Um, I was told we're not making a specific forecast on uh, location. We're making an overall assessment of the impact, uh, not setting out particular numbers for the impact of relocation or any other effect. This year, you do have a table, uh, 3.12, which sets out numbers for 1920 up to 2324, uh, suggesting the impact. Uh, of immediate tax residency changes, longer term migration effects to and from Scotland. And while you acknowledge that there are more people uh, in, in the most recent year report, you report 1617 moving to Scotland than from Scotland, uh, you're, you're now at a point where you're putting specific numbers uh, onto some of these questions where, where last year 
you weren't putting specific numbers. Can I ask how you've gone about changing that methodology and, and what exactly has changed? It's a simple methodological. I mean, I think it's really a question of uh, how big the, you know, I mean, we, as we, you can see from the table, the effect is really quite small, but it is, you know, one that is now big enough that we think is, you know, worth the, the effort of, of doing the, the work on. So I think, you know, as this, this effect, as the differences in taxes have got bigger, it's become, you know, more material for us to, to think about. And that's the sort of, you know, the, the, the process element of it. But obviously the technical element is, is a different issue. The central question we were looking at last year was a, a different question. was about an increase of, of uh, one point in the higher rate, which is a relatively small increase spread across people, whereas here we're looking at a different question. We're looking at the, at the effect of the difference between the Scottish higher rate taxes, including national insurance contributions, and the UK rate. And we, we made a judgment this year that that we needed to particularly look at the behavioural effects of that difference mm. in rather more detail. And also what we've done is we've, we've used some of these elasticities I was talking about before, where you can say uh, a given percentage change in, in tax, or di a given percentage tax difference between two countries would cause a, a given percentage change in the tax taxable income in those countries. We try to help you by translating that into what could the, what would that would, what would that mean in terms mm. of the number of taxpayers. Now there are some other assumptions in there. You have to make some assumptions about the average earnings of the people in those groups. Mm -hmm. But one feature you'll see in Table 3.12 is that the response in terms of tax residency is much stronger than the effects on uh, migration because we've made the assumption Tax residency is something people can shift quite easily. So we've Some. assumed a higher res response rate on tax residency mm. than on migration because migration is a much bigger decision. You have, you have to choose to, to buy a house and move your whole family to a different region. So we've used somewhat different elasticities. Yeah. Um, again, coming out from other studies that we've, we've looked at to underpin those numbers. And just, just finally, because... Um, some of the discussion last year was about the fact that there are some comparisons that can be made with uh, tax differences between U.S. states, but there are there are you know some big differences yeah, there in, in sure. terms of the context and the the scale of what we're talking about geographically. Um, I wonder if if it's possible for you to give us um, perhaps in in writing another time an overview of the the specific other jurisdictions that you've studied, uh, because I think that there's there's some evidence from some some other European countries that actually. Uh, mobility is, is much less for people at the higher end of the income scale because they're much more physically invested in, in the place that they're, they're living in. We can follow yeah. up that question in I writing. Mean, yes. Yeah. Quite a good study, a study on, on the Spanish uh, system where they, you know, they have that across the regions. And so I think that's, uh, and that's I think one of the strongest studies we looked at was on, on Spain. So I, was, I, I just think it'd be really useful. Yeah. 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 yeah, I just think it'd be useful on an ongoing basis yeah. to know what, what yeah. other places you're looking at yeah. as we, as we, as we okay. look at this year yeah. by year. Right. I think one further question on behavioural changes, Tom. It was actually um, on the um, increase in um, higher and additional rate payers. If that's okay. It was just a supplementary to the it's, it's still stolen related to the behavioural issue that I started off. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. It's just a very brief question to, um, to Professor Elf. Um, you, you described one of the drivers for an increase in, in higher and additional rate payers in Scotland as forecast would be these higher and additional rate payers potentially relocating to Scotland. Now, I just want to clarify, would this be that they would be perhaps working in other parts of the UK but would be resident in Scotland for tax purposes? Would they be setting up businesses in Scotland or relocating businesses in Scotland which would drive their, um, this increase? Or are there vacancies in um, high salary jobs which are currently unfulfilled? It would be people from other parts of the UK or elsewhere coming to um, fill and as a consequence be Scottish uh, registered taxpayers and which would lead to this increase as you described? It would be a mixture of all of those types of factors. As I say, people will see new opportunities arising mm. in one country which make them want to move from another country. So it could be that there are people out there who 
of doing a job in, in, in England, and they're now given the opportunity to do the same job at a higher salary in Scotland. So you might get a consultant working in the NHS in England who gets a, pro a promotion to a job, a higher paid job in Scotland. You might get people moving for, the, for those reasons. There might be people who are working both sides of the border. And they're, sometimes they're working in London, sometimes they're working in Scotland, and they just change their residency requirements. Yeah. My understanding, what I'm keen to understand is what is the balance between the creation of new higher paid jobs within Scotland, which theoretically could be fulfilled by anyone, including people currently resident in Scotland, and are there a particular category of jobs that would be uh, performed by people elsewhere in the UK, but they would be resident in Scotland? Perhaps it could be someone living in Edinburgh who commutes to London working in financial services, for example, and comes back, but they're a registered Scottish taxpayer, hence that's why the uh, revenue would accrue to Scotland rather than the Treasury. Could, could I just uh, say, say something that um, we do have right now a fairly tight labour market in mm -hmm. Scotland. Um, so that means that, um, you know, it, it isn't that there may be new jobs or mm -hmm. new businesses. We're not looking at uh, this tax from that oh. perspective. But um, as there are opportunities and openings, um, mm -hmm. the Scottish organisation will need to pay to attract the right person to it. Um, and so that, that has an impact here as well. Uh, so, so, but, but we're not starting by saying how many new companies do we expect to no. start and how many jobs will that create? That just the to focus. understand that inward migration is essential for driving this increase in um, higher and additional tax payers. It, it, tax earnings about. growth as well. Sorry, uh -huh. David. Yeah. So, sorry, in, in terms of the increase on the number of taxpayers, uh -huh. It's driven partly by increases in the number of taxpayers. Mm -hmm. But the largest part of that driver is the fact of what we talked before before, where mm -hmm. earnings increase, uh -huh. you, you're sucking existing taxpayers in Scotland into that top rate band. Mm -hmm. So that's that's by far and away the more, most important driver here. Because as Susan says, we've got a very tight labour market. Population is not projected to grow very much here. So the, the growth in the number of taxpayers is a relatively small factor in terms of okay. sucking people. It's large as a drive, the increase in earnings, and the fact that the top rate threshold is frozen, that's the big driver. I appreciate it. Thank you for that clarification. We'll, we'll move on to earnings issues more generally, because you introduced that now. Tom James, I think you were going to kick that session, session off. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener, and uh, good morning. I'm interested in um, sort of pay and employment rates and, and how that contributes through to the overall tax position um, compared with the the budget that was agreed in February 2018 the, the forecast position in relation to 1920 has deteriorated by 963 million and the economic aspect of that is 183 million uh, and 183 million decline um, and that is kind of underpinned in terms of pay and employment by what you're saying compared with what you gave us in, in uh, December 2017 uh, as a, a, a slight decline uh, in pay rates uh, and also employment rates. So <laughs> I'm interested in how, how that has been built up. Well, I mean, I guess you know, the comparison we're thinking of is really, compared to our previous forecast, the earnings picture has actually improved somewhat. Um, and that's really just the basis of, of the last few quarters of data that have, have given us stronger earnings pictures. So I think I'm not quite sure which comparison you're, you're making. But you know, the, um, to be specific, I'm asking about the comparison with last December. So the position right. has declined from last December. Yeah, so we, yeah, so we took the forecast down in the, in, the, in the last forecast, but then we brought it back up again, but not as far as we did yeah. December. And that's really just an issue of outturns for earnings that we've seen in the, in the last few quarters. They look uh, very weak uh, in a previous, prior to our previous forecast. They, they've got slightly stronger. So it's really just responding to actual outturn data, which admittedly for Scotland is, you know, is a hodgepodge of different measures, but the, the measures... Um, really, sort of, we, the consensus of the measures is that the, the position is slightly improved in the last few months, but it, it did worsen uh, prior to our previous forecast. 
Right, so if you look at the OBR on these forecasts, they're, they're forecasting stronger earnings growth and stronger employment growth. I'm not asking you to comment on their forecasts, but you know, why, why in Scotland have we got a picture of um, declining earnings growth and declining em employment rate? Well, first, I mean, I think the, the, the differences are quite small. I mean, I think, you know, so we... we I think yeah, the, but that's the, the overall yeah, trend. Over, yeah, so I think we're talking, the, we're talking in this, but, uh, but I think the, but the key point being that you know, the Scottish-specific numbers point to a slightly different picture than the, than, than the UK-wide numbers, and that's where this is coming from. It's, uh, yeah, what, so, I'm in, yeah. what I'm interested in tr is in trying to understand what are the drivers for those numbers? Uh, that's a more difficult one. I mean, I think one of the things we've seen is that the productivity performance in... Scotland over the last uh, few years has been somewhat worse than the rest of the UK, and I think that's that's a, that's probably a, an underlying driver. It's hard to to translate directly, but that's you, know, you can sort of see the link uh, which should be that would be there. So I think that would be one thing I would point to. So, so, so you're saying productivity is weaker. So what's what's causing productivity <laughs> to be weaker? Okay, then that's a very big question. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, I think it's it, it is hard. You know, this is uh, an area where, you know, uh, across all countries in the, in the world at the moment, we're really struggling to work out why productivity performance is is weak across countries. And the fact that the, the, you know the, the productivity performance in Scotland in the last few years has been marginally worse than the rest of the UK. I'm afraid uh, I know I don't know the answer to that question because we d we don't really know the drivers of the of, of why productivity has been so weak uh, for the last sort of ten years across any country really. Just going back to the pay issue, one of the comments you made in your paper was that in relation to average hours worked, that had been falling in recent years, but you saw it has been static going ahead. So, what what's the basis for that comment? Sorry, we repeat the question. Sorry, it's the. You said in uh, in your paper published in December yeah. that in, in discussing pay and productivity, you, there's a comment that the average hours worked per household um, had been declining in yeah. recent years, but looking ahead, it was going to become more static. Yeah, yeah. What's the basis for that? What's the I evidence think, base for that? Well, problem? I think one of the keys is obviously, as we've already mentioned, the labour market is tighter. And one way, the, you know, that, that tightness um, shows itself is, is is hours go up, you know, so there's more over time. People are asked to do more hours. You know, there's less sort of slacker generally in the economy. So I think that would be one of the, the drivers of, uh, of why the hours uh, d haven't declined so much. There may be a factor, I don't, I'm not absolutely certain, but just a reminder that the shape of our population, if you're comparing to the whole of the UK, is a little different. We have uh, an increasing proportion of people uh, in the highest age groups who are not necessarily active in employment, as the people in the middle age groups, if you will, and that, that creates some of that same effect, so that the people who are employed, who are working, um, their services are needed, and so they may... Uh, be offered and may take more hours. Can, can I come back to something Professor Francis Breeden said, because it was quite interesting. Um, and on Scottish-specific numbers, you used the words, the hodgepodge of numbers available for Scotland. That seems to suggest that in some way, the numbers that we've got available to work with in Scotland are perhaps not as robust as they could be. And, and is this because it's an extrapolation of UK numbers? And what can we do to improve that in that case? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's I, I, maybe I, that was a slight talk. It's more that there are there's more than one. I mean, that was really my key point is that when we look at the earnings profile in Scotland, we're we're, we're drawing on about four different uh, sources. Um, and I think I mean, well, I, I can't necessarily comment on whether that data is, you know, stronger than you know the UK equivalent. But it's it, it is the case that when we when we're making the judgment about earnings. I wouldn't, we wouldn't, we're not making it on the basis of one earnings series, we're making it by looking at a, a range of, of, of series, which you, you can see in the, in the report. Can but I just add, if you look at table 2.7 in, in, in the main report on page 64, you can see what we've done is we've summarised the, the, the sort of the sources of earning that are available to us, um, and you can start to see the picture coming out there of, of stronger earnings growth over um, in 2018, which is reflected in our report. I can see that now. But are these the data sources that you mentioned in your table, 
Is, are these subsamples of the UK or are these Scottish specific samples? The, the, these are basically, um, I think the, the bulk of them um, are Scottish parts of UK surveys. Um, some of those are actually boosted in Scotland, proportionate to the population size. Um, and then the, the QNAS one, the final one, comes from the national account, so it's slightly different. Yeah, it must make your job more, more difficult than that, than, in that area, though. I think it's, it's a characteristic of working with regional economies. The, yeah. the, the, the data isn't as good as the, the national economy, but I think, as we sort of said in September, um, in our data statement, or statement of data needs, you know, there are a lot of advances being made in, 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 in Scottish data. Scotland is pretty well served by, by its economic data. There are gaps which we identified, but you know, the, the picture is not, not, not as bad okay. as it could be elsewhere. That's fine. Adam. I'm still struggling to reconcile all these various figures about forecast income tax receipts and forecast income tax payers. So, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm focusing on additional rate taxpayers because they contribute so much income tax, and income tax is so important to the devolved basket of taxation. And we know that the top 1% of income tax payers in the UK contribute more than 28% of total income tax receipts. So that's why it's, you know, it's, it's critical to the future prosperity of the Scottish um, government's spending plans to um, maintain and attract ever higher numbers of additional rate taxpayers. That's why, that's why this is so important. And your um, forecast increase in the number of additional rate taxpayers is, you know, to use um, uh, Professor Smith's phrase, surprisingly large. Um, and you, uh, it's good to know that you're not surprised by that surprise. But, you know, it's, it, it's a very significant increase. We're talking about over the course of only a four-year period, the number of additional rate taxpayers going up by more than a third. And yet, over the same period, you are forecasting income tax receipts to go up much more modestly than that. You are forecasting in income tax receipts to go up, yes, but from 11, 11 and a half million in 1920 to only just a, over 13 million in uh, 2022, 2023. So what accounts for what appears to be that variation between, on the one hand, the number of additional rate taxpayers going up very significantly, but on the other, the uh, um, forecast income tax receipts for Scotland going up, but relatively modestly, when we know that additional rate taxpayers do contribute so much of overall income tax receipts? And it's not behavioural change, because behavioural change no, accounts no, for only no, six, no, but, but, six million. But, but, but I think it's important in thinking about the arithmetic of that to remember that we're talking about people, the, the additional taxpayers are mainly coming from people whose incomes, because of income growth, move them from one taxpayer category to another. Yeah. Now, it may be the case that the additional taxpayer, additional rate taxpayers as a whole pay a higher proportion of income tax revenue. But... But for the individual who moves category, they're moving from just below the tax threshold to just above the tax threshold, and their marginal rate may go up very significantly, but the actual, ta the actual tax bill paid by someone who moves from just below the threshold to just above the threshold changes relatively <coughs> little. So, you're, so uh, the, the numbers changes are, ch are driven by people who are close to the threshold and move over it, whereas the, I mean, the, the numbers of taxpayers are driven by that, whereas the tax revenues figures are driven by the average tax paid by different taxpayer categories. And the, av and the, ta the average tax paid by someone who moves just over the threshold doesn't, doesn't change that much. Okay. Neil, and then I think Tom's got a question as well. Yeah, just following on from, from Adam Tompkins' questions. At our last meeting, uh, David Phillips of the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, warned that there was a particular big risk if Scottish revenues were overestimated and the OBR underestimated UK revenues. Um, do you agree with that analysis and, and um, what is the current risk and the risk of that likely to be over the next two to three budgets? I, I think that, um, that observation was in relation to the to the reconciliations issue um, and how that um, <laughs> forecast differences um, could drive the, the sort of reconciliations arithmetic in a sort of particularly bad way for the Scottish budget. So I think he was just highlighting the circumstances in which that could happen. Um, 
what our report does do is it, it, it looks at, and there's a table um, in the report which looks at the sort of what we think is the current position on um, reconciliations and makes a, a forecast of that forecast difference. Um, and that, that does show that um, those adverse circumstances at the moment seem to be likely, but of course they can change. It's, it's just a forecast of a, a forecast difference. Okay, Tom. A question picking up um, on uh, the issue of data again, uh, pertinent particularly to um, average earnings. I just wonder in terms of the composition of earnings across Scotland, how much that informs how you come to your forecast on earnings. So for example, there's particular areas where there will be a concentration of high earners, historically perhaps in the North East due to oil and gas or financial services in Edinburgh, which will to some extent inflate average earnings across Scotland because of that small concentration of high earners. Now, consequently, these sectors may be more exposed than others to particular effects. Um, economic shocks, for example. So, in terms of your forecasts for average earnings, how do you how do you come to them? What is the sort of data sources that you have available, and how does that take account of regional variations where we do have perhaps clusters of higher earners in different parts of Scotland? Our approach is, is, is very much at the aggregate mm -hmm. level, so I don't think we get into these these regional mm -hmm. issues that much in in, uh, uh, in when we do these sort of analyses. And um, I, mean, I think the, the effects you're talking mm -hmm. about, you you would. That, that's fine for our purposes. It, mm -hmm. it just means that potentially the earnings could be more volatile because uh -huh. of these regional effects. But as long as we, well, our focus is obviously always on the on the Scotland wide uh -huh. implications of of those changes. So. But I think it's also fair to say, Francis, that when we think about that sort of aggregate macro picture, we are thinking about, um, in particular, the onshore oil and gas industry. Uh -huh. So we do take that into account, and we take into account sort of the, the, the prospect for sort of financial industries. So mm -hmm. in a sense, we, in, 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 Francis is absolutely right, we, we think about these at a sort of a very high aggregate uh -huh. level for Scotland, and we are not sort of blind to the consequences of sort of, you know, different sectors and how they are going to evolve over time. And, and just an example, last year in looking at land and buildings transaction tax, given the state of the oil and gas sector, we did focus specifically and had some work done on uh, the Northeast and what was happening uh, in that area in particular around uh, housing prices and transactions and so forth. Um, so if we think that there really is something happening, we, we could go in and look uh, more forensically. Um. And in terms of the, the comparison between average earnings forecast for Scotland and for the UK as a whole, I think there's a, different, a difference of about 0.3% in favour of the rest of the UK. Is that statistically significant? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Angela. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to the, the panel. Um, Dame Susan, in your uh, opening remarks, you said that Brexit uh, was at the front uh, of your uh, collective minds. Um, and I uh, notice that, uh, again, in your remarks and in your uh, report, you said that your forecasting is based on an orderly Brexit. Um, although, you know, I think the, 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 the forecasts for an orderly uh, Brexit are, are perhaps, if I can be kind, rather fluctuating. Um, and you, you speak a, you're a fair bit in your report about the, the uh, uncertainty around uh, Brexit as well. But I just wondered whether you have undertaken any specific work on the range of scenarios, including a no-deal Brexit, on the impact on the tax take in Scotland. Uh, we, we have discussed um, matters of that sort uh, extensively, but as I hinted at in my opening comments, even if there is a no-deal Brexit or a disorderly um, exit from, uh, from Europe, that doesn't have one shape. It's not like a Braeburn apple and that's it. You know, apples come in a lot of varieties. And um, we need, if, if that is the outcome of the parliamentary vote, there will then be a period of time where the detail around what does that mean and how will that operate happens. Um, we could, we wouldn't be resourced and it wouldn't make sense to imagine all of that and to do lots and lots of different forecasts at this point. We need to wait to see what some of that detail is uh, and we would then um, at the right time, uh, remember that we also forecast in relation to your uh, timetable in the Parliament, um, produce a forecast for that. But uh, we're not sitting today forecasting every possible because we don't know what those details are. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't, we don't have the detail. Mm -hmm. And that's really the reason that we, we stayed with the notion of an orderly exit because that seemed the, the more likely thing. Um, and we don't have any detail right now um, that tells us that it will be other than that. You can imagine it might be, but we don't have that evidence right now. We, we need to wait for the evidence. Okay, I understand the difficulties in and around the, 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 the lack of detail and the uncertainty, and I wouldn't expect anybody in the panel to have um, a crystal ball. Um, but I did notice that in paragraph 29 of your report, you, you did start to tease out some of the underlying issues uh, in and around Brexit. Uh, productivity uh, predicted to be lower in part uh, due to Brexit, you talk about international trade, uh, you know, the difficulties around predicting the future economic relationship between the UK and, and the EU. But you specifically begin to talk about migration, and I'm particularly interested in Brexit and the impact um, on migration, uh, given that, you know, it's, there, there's other a fairly broad um, agreement that we've got a demographic challenge in Scotland and you know population growth is important to, to, to economic growth o overall. But bearing in mind that there has been a UK government white paper with a proposal for a £30,000 minimum salary threshold uh, for um, EU uh, migrants, which according to the Scottish Government would reduce um, EU migration by 80%. And we know that all our population, predicted population growth is based on mm -hmm. um, mi migration. You know, I wondered whether you've given some thought, you've not done the work as yet, but some thought about how um, you will follow the impact on reducing migration into a tax take uh, and into our overall economic performance, as it is going to, uh, you know, uh, appear to be a very live matter. Yeah, so um, I'm going to ask uh, Alistair if he could give you some detail. I would simply say that um, these three factors um, don't relate to orderly or disorderly or no Brexit at all. These are factors that we have been considering yeah. as we've thought about Brexit in our economy forecast um, last year as well, and we've discussed them in depth. And this is our judgment about uh, the impact on migration um, uh, post-Brexit. Post but Alistair, do you want to give some more um, detail in response? Yes, well, I'd, I'd just first of all emphasize that point. Paragraph. Uh, 29 of our summary refers to our existing forecast, mm -hmm. which includes, as Susan said, uh, an assumption a sent, an assumption that uh, there will be an orderly exit of the UK from the EU in economic terms, essentially happening at the end of 2020, at the end of the transition period. And that assumption put some downside forces into our forecast, as listed there. We're assuming that there will be negative effects in that central scenario on migration, productivity, and trade, which will lead to income being lower than, than it would be otherwise. Um, what, what we haven't done, as Susan said, is, is look at what these effects would be if there were a disorderly Brexit. We would expect them looking at the work that other people have done on, on uh, no-deal Brexits, we'd expect all of these negative effects to be bigger and there to be some other negative effects as well and possibly some really quite big negative short-run adjustment effects at the act round about the time of uh, Brexit itself. But we produced one forecast based on our central set of Brexit and, uh, and other assumptions. That's our job. Um, if we proceed with an orderly Brexit, then as we find out more about the way migration policy, for example, develops, that will be the time for us to feed more elaborate assumptions about migration into, into our forecast. And uh, uh, you, you must be right uh, that if whatever form of Brexit we have generates bigger reductions in migration than the ones that we're assuming in our current forecast, then that will have further negative effects on, on the economy. And one other thing I'd 
draw to your attention is that we need to worry about negative effects of migration, not just because of the kind of demographic effects that you talked about, which are, are of course, important. Uh, the, the age 16 to 64 population in Scotland is a, a lower proportion of the overall population than, uh, than in the rest of the UK, but also of the link between migration and productivity. My, the, the, the flow of migrants uh, are not into overwhelmingly low-paid jobs. A lot of migrants come with high levels of education and skill, high levels of work commitment. And there's no doubt that migration has a very positive effect on, on productivity. And the, the expectation would be that reductions in migration will have negative effects, not just on direct de demographic effects, but negative effects on productivity as well. But these are things that we will need to explore when we find out more about the Brexit path that we're currently embarked on as it develops, or an alternative Brexit path if that's uh, where, where we end up. But th these are all uh, very important things that we will need to give careful consideration to in the future, but we have not done that yet. I suppose I'm interested in how quickly you'll be able to give this consideration once you know some light has been uh, shed on, on the path. Uh, that we're about to um, embark upon, um, given that EU migrants are indeed uh, net contributors, uh, you know, in terms of population, you know, presumably tax take if the, the working age populations grow up, and a very important point um, about um, productivity, because it would, you know, appear to me that whatever form Brexit takes, and in particular uh, the uh, UK government white paper on migration. Um, you talk about downside risks, I would talk about um, a devastating impact on our e economy. Um, all of this, bearing in mind our economic performance relative to the UK, has you know, a, a big impact on how we fund public services in Scotland. Um, you know, how quickly you know, will you be able to change your assumptions and do some forecasts that, you know, scope out the shape and size of uh, the, the, the challenges that we are undoubtedly about to face? Well, yeah. well it, it's important to be realistic about the, the time scale. It doesn't take long to change assumptions, uh, but, but changing the forecasts as a result of a change of assumptions is a, pro, is a process that, that takes time. We have uh, a, a forecasting cycle. Uh, if for our next set of forecasts, we have a clearer picture of what Brexit means, then that, will, that, that can be fed into the forecasting cycle. There's a limit to the extent to which we, the, the, foreca the, the length of the forecasting cycle can change, uh, not least because it will take time for us to understand what, what changes we need to look at in our next set of forecasts. Um, because we may get more clarity at some point about what form Brexit is going to take. If it were a no-deal Brexit, then there would be uh, probably significant macroeconomic changes at the UK level in response to those, and we would need clarity about what those were in order to produce our, our forecasts. We're producing... Um, and, I, I, and, and I don't think one should imagine that our economic forecasts should be the front line of assessing the policy, uh, the immediate effects of policy towards Brexit. We we will work through the uh, just to stick with your example, the effects of Brexit on productivity. If we see significant new effects coming along for our next forecast, possibly imagine circumstances in which the, the timetable for our next forecast would change a bit. But we're, we're not in the we're not in the business of providing policy analysis for politicians making decisions about Brexit. You might wish that we were, but that, that's not what we do. So to, just to sum that up, you, you started by saying how quickly. Um, we can only move as quickly as the detail emerges about what that form of Brexit, whatever form it is, happens. So we are you know, restrained until some of that detail uh, takes shape. Yeah, I mean, and I get, get the point that, um, you know, you have a, a specific job in relation to um, 
the, the Scottish budget as opposed to policy choices of, of Scottish politicians. But the reality is, in your report, you've started to scope out, you know, what the impact um, of Brexit would, would be, and your forecast won't be worth a jot if you're not doing some sort of um, horizon scanning. And you know, Brexit is uh, looming large in some shape or form. Yeah, we'll, we, you know, we will move as quickly as we are able to move. Obviously, this will be a tremendous change, whatever the form of Brexit, and we're well aware of that. Yeah. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries on this. Emma? Thank you, Convener. It's just a quick sup, actually, to pick up on what Angela Constance is saying. In Dumfries and Galloway, we've got 48% of um, Scotland's dairy farms, and the big dairy farms have... Romanians, Lithuanians, and uh, and you know folk from Poland, and they're not making thirty thousand pounds a year, and so there is a bit of a mix, and I know there's work being done by the Scottish Dairy Hub to look at exactly how many migrants. So when we're talking about a devastating impact on uh, of Brexit and immigration, that is a is going to have a, a massive effect on productivity if there's nobody to milk the cows in Dumfries and Galloway, which contribute to the Scotland's economy. So it's just to pick up on your thoughts about that, because that's something that uh, I think is really worth looking into. And I, I think that's right, that the agricultural sector is is, uh, is one that is particularly vulnerable to the effects of Brexit on, on migration. It's probably also one of the sectors which is most at risk from the effects of a no-deal Brexit, because if we leave the EU without a deal, um, then it's going to be very difficult for British agriculture and fisheries to sell their products into the rest of the EU, and that's a, a, a big part of the, their market. So that's another big Brexit effect under a no-deal scenario that will be relevant uh, for that sector. So uh, there are no... No question, but that Brexit, in whatever form it takes, will be will uh, be providing big questions for us in our next cycle of forecasts. Okay. Let me do a quick sup as well. Yeah, very briefly, I appreciate there's much of Brexit that could perhaps only be termed as nebulous. However, one clear scenario that may emerge if the UK government's favoured policy is implemented, i.e. the Withdrawal Act, is the potential for a backstop scenario to emerge if the Irish Protocol is indeed invoked, which would um, come into effect within the forecasting period that we've been considering today, early into the next decade. Now, clearly the terms of that are quite well defined, including the regulatory diversions that would occur within the UK between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Has there been any consideration given to that in terms of informing scenarios for your forecasts into the 2020s? The short answer to that is, is no, we, we have not looked at those sorts of issues in any detail. And, and that, that particular example is perhaps a good example of why it would be premature for us to do this. Uh, the, it, because it's simply not clear, and it doesn't matter how carefully you read the draft withdrawal agreement, it's not clear how much regulatory <coughs> difference there will be between Northern Ireland uh, and, and the rest of the UK, UK in a backdrop uh -huh. scenario, because, as I understand it, Northern Ireland will be obliged to follow EU rules in relation mm -hmm. to goods regulation. But the reality is that producers throughout the UK will have a very strong incentive to stick to the same rules as well. Mm -hmm. the, the, the companies who are selling cars in Northern Ireland or the supermarket chains who are selling food products in Northern Ireland are selling the same products in Northern Ireland uh, as they're selling in the rest of the UK selling the same cars in Northern Ireland as they're selling throughout the whole of the EU. These, these UK producers will, in reality, be sticking to EU regulation in any event. And that's just an example of the kind of thing that needs to be thought through and understood, and in the first instance, not by us, because that, you know, that's, you know, we're, we're, we're not... Brexit analysts with uh -huh. economic forecasters. But it's an example of the kind of complex issue that we will need to understand the effects of much better as it evolves. In the perhaps unlikely event that the withdrawal um, 
agreement is agreed to by the UK Parliament in the coming weeks, and that then that is clearly a concrete scenario that could emerge, the Irish Protocol being invoked. If that scenario does materialise, do you imagine that the SFC are going to be considering what the implications of that, of that would be, given that it's a concrete real scenario that's legally defined, and that will have to inform at least some of your forecasts and scenario um, planning? Well, frankly, my, my initial thought of that would be that if if the government's withdrawal agreement uh, does uh, pass through Parliament and we uh, formally exit in, uh, at the end of March into a transition period in which nothing changes until, essentially nothing changes until the end of December, that's the, that's the scenario in wh on which our current forecast is based. And I, I'm not sure that we would feel under strong pressure to to set about uh, producing uh, a, a new forecast other than on our, our okay. planned timetable. It's, uh, it's the picture where the withdrawal agreement fails to get through Parliament and we have a, no, a disorderly Brexit at some point in the next few months is the one that, uh, where I th everyone involved in economic policy making and forecasting would need to think about what work needs to be done and in what order. And as I said earlier, we would need to think about how much clarity we needed to have about the policy responses of both the UK and the Scottish governments to that scenario before we thought about what the implications would be for our next round of forecasting. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. You made your position very clear. Thank you. Murdo. Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, I've got some questions on income tax forecasts, but just, just before I come to that, I wonder if I can ask just a follow-up question, Professor Smith, to something you, you were talking about a moment ago in relation to, to migration that I thought was very interesting, and particularly talking about the economic contribution made by migrants. And I wonder if you're aware if there's any um, difference in terms of the evidence we have in terms of whether um, the economic contribution of, of migrants varies depending on whether they are migrants from EU countries from non-EU countries, or indeed migrants to Scotland from other parts of the United Kingdom? Uh, the short answer to your question is no. I, 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 there is a lot of, of work on the positive effects of, of uh, migration on economic performance, but I can't off the top of my head, and it's certainly not, not in the, the report in front of me, point you to, to evidence of those kinds of of differences. Okay, thank you. I think it's, it might be quite an interesting area to look at in the future if, 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 if there's an argument there will be a, a reduction in EU migrants, whether there might be increases in migrants from other parts of the world or indeed other parts of the United Kingdom, trying to understand if there are differences. That might be quite useful. Anyway, but that, that, that wasn't really what I was going to ask about, but I thought it was an interesting, interesting point to, to, to get some uh, get an answer on. Um, I really wanted to ask about the uh, SFC's uh, projections for income tax forecasts, where uh, what we've seen is quite a substantial uh, reduction in your uh, forecast for income tax receipts uh, as compared to the forecast you produced at this time last year. And uh, obviously we have a, a narrative from you as to why that has occurred, and to an extent these reductions are offset uh, by changes to the, the block grant adjustment. Um, but I think what is of interest to this committee is what the direct impact of all these changes is on the Scottish Government's budget for the coming year. So perhaps you could tell us what exactly is the net impact of all these changes on what we're now expecting for income tax for the coming year for the, the Scottish Government's budget. This is set out in Table 6, uh, or, or just below paragraph 41 of our summary, uh, where uh, the, the top panel of that table shows uh, our forecast for income tax for 2019-20 uh, and the forecast for the block grant adjustment uh, and the, the net difference of £182 million. Yep. Pounds. So that's the... That I think is the the answer to your question. There's the there's our forecast for the the 2019-20 year uh, about net 
receipts in relation to income tax? Yes, uh, yes, I can, I can see that, and, th and thank you for the answer. But uh, am I right in saying that at uh, this time last year, the figure you were forecasting there was 591 million? So we're talking about a difference of roughly 400 million pounds less than we, we were thinking we would have at this time last year. Yes, but both the both our tax forecast uh, and the UK tax forecasts, I mean the so and the forecasts which underlie the block grant adjustment have changed very significantly because we've had outturn data yeah. um, for 2016-17 in the intervening period, and that has shifted both both numbers down quite mm. significantly. Yes. But you're right to identify that the gap between them has has also reduced. So we're so we're now forecasting less net impact on the Scottish budget. Now there are there are many moving parts that go into our tax forecast and into the OBR's forecasts of UK taxes that then feed into the block grant adjustment. Uh, but one issue that is perhaps worth thinking about uh, is that the, the UK, UK tax forecasts have been pushed up this year by uh, the unexpectedly strong performance of tax receipts in, in 2018. And that has led the, the OBR to increase its forecasts of UK income tax and, and other taxes as well. Uh, the, we don't have uh, as detailed information about Scottish tax receipts as the OBR has about UK tax receipts because the, the range of data is, is, is less. Uh, but in the, in the information that we have, uh, there is, there is not evidence uh, that Scottish income tax receipts have gone up in the same way that UK-wide tax receipts have gone up. This may be because uh, there are a higher proportion of high-rate taxpayers in, in the UK. The, the increase in UK income tax receipts, there's some evidence, and notice I'm talking very cautiously because both in relation to the UK and Scotland, this is, this is some early evidence. There is some evidence uh, that UK income tax receipts have gone up particularly at the, the higher end of the income distribution. There are proportionally fewer Scottish taxpayers, fewer higher rate taxpayers in the Scottish income tax distribution. So currently, uh, we think that Scottish tax receipts have probably not been uh, subject to the same rate of increase in 2018 as UK tax receipts. And that's, that may be and I stress the word maybe, that may be the reason why uh, the, uh, the difference between our income tax forecast and the block grant adjustment forecast has narrowed so that the net impact on the Scottish Government's budget is now £183 million rather than a larger number. Okay. Thank you. I think I think I understand that. I think I, I, I appreciate <laughs> that everything to do with the block grant adjustment is is very complicated, and one has to work hard to keep on thinking on, on the right lines. That's the way it is. Yes. I mean, the, the the advice we got from our budget advisor was that your latest forecasts implied a worsening of the net tax position of four hundred million pounds compared to your forecast this time last year. Is that correct? Y yes, that's correct. That's yeah. shown in the, the, the that's the, that's, um, the, well, you look at table eight, the income tax re reconciliations yeah. uh, figure a uh, couple of pages on, uh, that's where we're seeing that for the 2018-19 budget, uh, the, the, the net uh, difference has changed yeah. from being plus 428 to minus 43. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's 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 very helpful. Um, and thank you for coming to table eight. Because I was going to ask you about this next because uh, this is looking at the potential uh, forecast uh, reconciliation um, in the future. Where for 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 the budget for the uh, for, for last year we're looking at a forecast reconciliation forecast reconciliation 145 million, which will kick in in the year 2020-21. And for the following year, for the year 2021 to 22, we're looking at a, a forecast reconciliation of minus 
472 million. Now, mm -hmm. these I appreciate are only forecasts, but yeah. if I, do I read that correctly, meaning that if, if your forecasts are correct, when setting the budget for 2021-22, the, the Scottish Finance Minister will be there for starting with a negative of 472 million. Yes, indeed, that's going to be a. Yeah. If, if this is the way it turned out, yeah. and when we have the outturn data for um, for 2018-19 in in whenever it is uh, mid 2020, and and the budget for 2021 is being set, then yes, that's a that's a okay. negative number, and and you're quite right to say this is this is a forecast of the extent to which a budget paced based on past forecasts, will turn out not to be accurate. We should probably not get overexcited about the, the specific numbers. Uh, but, what it, but, it, but behind your question is, uh, as I understand it, the observation that these are quite large numbers mm. relative to the budget. Yeah. And so reconciliations are going to be a very significant issue for Scottish budget management from... Uh, next year onwards. Indeed, uh, that was the point I was going to come on to because we're talking about half a billion pounds effectively, yeah. which is a very sizable chunk of, of money coming out of a budget in what will actually be an election year, so that could then lead to an interesting uh, political scenario at that time. Um, but I, I was ever going to ask you what the impact this would be on the Scotland Reserve, because you go on in your report in uh, paragraphs 115 to 117 to talk about the amount of money in the Scotland Reserve, and you observe in paragraph 116 that in terms of the budget for the coming financial year, the Scottish Government are proposing to draw down 85 million from the Capital Reserve and 250 million from the Resource Reserve, and you observe that that is the maximum allowed within the fiscal framework. And I'm just wondering, given this looming black hole that may or may not materialise, how prudent it might be for the finance secretary to be drawing down the maximum from the reserve when perhaps he should be filling it up. Well, I, th I think that's, uh, I mean, we, we've set out the facts as uh, we see them here as clearly as we can because we do think that these are important numbers, but, uh, but making judgments about the, the prudence of the decisions is for the cabinet secretary and for you, not for us. Okay. Thank you. You get a chance to ask him next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, Emma. Thank you, convener. Um, I think we've covered a lot this mo um, this morning. It's been interesting to hear about some of the, I guess, the political arguments or the economic arguments for how we can have um, income tax revenues being higher or lower in some areas. So I'm interested to to hear about what would main factors be, whether it's economic or political, in determining that the, the forecasts might be higher or lower in Scotland or the rest of the UK, for instance, because uh, because with the forecasts that you make might not be accurate in some areas, depending on what's happening in with Brexit or other wider areas. Well, I mean, I guess there's a general issue about forecasting is, you know, um, sadly there is, you know, it, it, you know, we do the best we can with the information we have today, but, um, you know, there, there are events looming that will, you know, will almost inevitably knock the, these numbers you know, off track. And that's, uh, that's the, I'm afraid, the, uh, the, the lot of a forecaster to, uh, to see their forecast almost inevitably. Uh, so, it's, um, I mean, is Scotland at a higher risk than the rest of the UK, specifically with some of the forecasting that that you have uh, engaged in? Um, no, I mean, I think, the, you know, obviously in the forecasting process, the, the issue of the data you start with is, is key, but I, don't, I, I can't really think of a particular risk that is... Uh, worse for Scotland than it is for, for the rest of the UK um, in, in terms of thinking about the, the, what, what could happen in the next few years. Is that? We do lay out some different factors. Um, uh, whether they, they crystallise as a risk or a downside risk 
you know, that's another matter, but the factors are, as we said before, that we have a higher proportion of the population uh, in the age 64 plus uh, group, that our population isn't growing, particularly the working age population, at quite the same rate as it is in the rest of the UK. So there are some factors that are different with this tight labor market that I mentioned. Um, so some of these can have positive or negative uh, impacts, but there are some core differences in our, uh, in our makeup. I think the final question on income tax issues and uh, is coming from Neil, and then we're going to LBTT with Willie, I think. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, in uh, Table 3.7 of your report, you've um, shown revised your income tax forecast down by £275 uh, million, pounds and due to UK policy changes of this, £199 million pounds is due to the increase in the personal allowance. Could you just clarify what UK policies account for the remaining seventy six million? Which page are you on? <laughs> I can get you the page on it. It's uh, ninety two, okay. So the question is, but I can't put my finger on the moment. Can we write to you with that one? Oh, sure, yeah. We have a list, it's quite detailed. But okay. I think that's probably the best way of handling that. Yes, that would help. Willie LBTT. Thanks very much, Bruce. At this stage of the meeting, you're delighted to get a question on land and buildings transaction tax from me. <laughs> <laughs> It was just simply to ask the, the, the forecasts for revenue for LBTT seem to be going up progressively year on year, but, but we hear that growth in house prices is, is perhaps slower in Scotland. So it was just to ask, why, why the difference? Why are we getting more revenue uh, when the, the growth is perhaps not there to match that? It, it, it can't sh just be down to the policy changes or an additional dwelling supplement. That wouldn't account for the difference. So it was just to get your view and the flavour of why we're getting more revenue in LBTT over the coming years. The very simple answer is it depends in those different bands of LBTT where the transaction activity is greatest. If you get a lot of activity at lower bands, that makes a difference. But Alistair, you probably are a resident no. expert on that. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's, it's just that, in, that over the period of the years, we do, ex you know, although house price increases are, are less than uh, than they've been at some points in the past, we're still projecting that over a period of time, house prices will go upwards. Uh, we also look at, as Susan said, that the, the distribution of sales between different bands changes from time to time. And putting all of these things together, we do forecast that, that, uh, that LBTT revenue will, will rise over the years. So it's mainly because of kind of thresholds and bandings rather than the policy change on additional dwelling yes. supplements. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes, because the policy change is built into all of the years of our forecast. So the, the rise over the years is, is basically driven by house price rises. Okay. Nice simple question and simple answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I think that concludes our evidence session this morning. I thank our witnesses very much indeed. As we all know this is a complicated area, so thank you for bearing with us and helping us understand it more clearly. Um, I now suspend this meeting for probably 10 minutes before we get into the next session. Thank you.
Okay, colleagues, um, we resume. And for the second session this morning, uh, we're joined by Robert Choate, who's the Chairman of the Office of Budget Responsibility. Robert, you've been before us a couple of times before, so we're grateful to see you again today. Thank you for coming. I welcome you to the meeting and I invite you to make a short opening statement if you wish to do so. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, convener. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, back as always. Uh, as I'm coming after Susan and her quintet, she's obviously covered quite a lot of uh, the territory already that I would normally uh, force you to suffer through in an opening peroration. So I'll, I'll keep just a, a couple of comments. One obviously is that you know the last time that we produced a forecast was now what seems distantly back uh, in uh, October. The big picture there was that despite the fact that the economy had not actually been performing very differently from how one had anticipated in previous forecasts, the annual growth rate last year fractionally lower but largely down to the weather-based distortions earlier in the year, the fiscal outturn uh, through 2018 was better than anticipated. And uh, that therefore had led to an improvement across the uh, uh, across the forecast, supplemented by us taking a slightly more positive view about prospects for employment uh, growth uh, over that uh, period. Uh, so the underlying fiscal position had improved in that forecast more than you would have expected simply by looking at the, uh, the economic uh, position. Indeed, sufficiently so that if the government had sat on its hands uh, in terms of policy at the UK level, you would have seen us on course for the first time to deliver the, uh, the balanced budget overall that is the government's uh, fiscal objective for the mid-2020s. Uh, As it happened, uh, that windfall had already been spent in effect by the Prime Minister in the previous June with the announcement of the additional money for the NHS. The other policy measures back in the UK budget amounted to a, uh, an additional giveaway in the near term, but one that in the uh, typical Augustinian pattern turned into a small net tightening towards the end of the uh, of the forecast. But uh, uh, essentially speaking, the uh, the combination of the better news in the underlying forecast and uh, the government's fiscal uh, giveaway left the path of borrowing in the medium term not very different from uh, how it had been uh, in the previous uh, forecast. In terms of timetable now, uh, obviously the next forecast that we will have will be for the spring. Uh, event for its spring fiscal event. We don't know yet when that is going to be. The government has obviously asked us to be prepared for something on the normal sort of timetable, so uh, you know, which would normally be the first couple of weeks of, of March or there or so. We'll, we'll see where we are on that. Uh, so for that forecast, we will get underway fairly soon with the, you know, the first round of the of the uh, of the economic and fiscal forecast. We go through three iterations basically in the run up to the point at which we close the forecast and then only allow uh, policy uh, changes to affect it thereafter. Uh, as Susan mentioned in in uh, her evidence. Uh, we and the Fiscal Commission have to date based the forecasts on the assumption of a relatively uh, uh, smooth, uh, non-disorderly uh, exit. Uh, obviously, uh, that's something that we will have to keep under review as we go through the successive iterations of this forecast as whether that is still the appropriate horse to be sitting on uh, as we get uh, towards the, uh, the date there and then uh, you know, we'll, we'll have choices to make in that. I suspect that Brexit will be coming up in questioning, so I'll, I'll probably leave uh, um, some of the uh, the content for that. Uh, uh, so, well, actually, let me let me leave it there, and uh, happy to expand on. What you well, want. thank you for that opening, Robert. Very grateful to you. Um, I'm going to go to James Kelly first for the first. Okay, questions. thanks a lot, uh, convener. Good morning, Robert. Um, I'm interested in the the, the kind of earnings uh, and employment, you know, forecasts. In terms of the SFE, uh, SFC, in, in relation to last year for Scotland, they are showing weaker earnings growth and weaker employment rate growth, uh, or weaker employment rates. Whereas in relation to your forecast compared with last year, you've got an improved position in relation to earnings and employment rates. Uh, I don't expect you to comment on the SFC forecast, but just in terms of your forecast, how did you? What were the drivers that produced a, a more optimistic position? Um, on the employment side, we reduced our estimate of the sustainable sort of equilibrium level of unemployment from where it had been previously. That's something that we've done 
uh, in a number of recent forecasts and has simply been a reflection of the fact that as unemployment has fallen, uh, quite often more rapidly than, uh, than uh, economists generally had anticipated, we have yet to see the substantive pickup in inflationary pressure and wage pressure that you might have anticipated. So on that basis, uh, by pushing down the, uh, the sustainable uh, level uh, of unemployment that, you, that the, the forecast will tend to in the long term, that gives you scope for greater employment growth over that period. So that's the main reason on that side. In terms of earnings growth, in the uh, obviously you're taking into account recent outturn data, which as you discussed in the previous session, there are different ways of measuring what's going on in earnings, surveys of them directly, measures which basically look at the amount of income and divide it by the number of people and see how that's moving. Uh, we have information... Uh, new source of information, real-time information from HMRC, which is you know, still at this stage, we're not placing huge, neither of us are placing huge amounts of waste on that, but it's an additional uh, source of information as well. As I think Francis Breeden was, uh, was saying, over the medium term, it's the, the outlook for real earnings growth is driven by your judgments on real productivity growth. Uh, and as you know, the big picture there is that you know we have seen much weaker real productivity growth over the period since the financial crisis, which would not surprisingly correspond to a period of weaker uh, earnings growth. And looking forward, uh, we took a judgment a couple of forecasts ago that we wouldn't expect earnings uh, productivity growth and therefore earnings growth to get back to the sort of historically normal levels. It would fall some way between the performance we've seen over recent years and over the early decades. As I understand it, um, I suspect that the weaker outlook for earnings growth in the SFC's forecast relative to us over the medium term is primarily down to them taking a slightly more pessimistic view of underlying productivity growth. If you look at the overall GDP growth numbers, roughly speaking over the medium term, we have the UK economy growing by about 1.5% a year. The SFC has the Scottish economy growing by uh, about 1% uh, uh, a year. I think the, the larger effect there is differences in population, but the difference that is accounted for by relative productivity growth is one that you would expect to feed through to a difference in the earnings profile. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, just in terms of the way you do your analysis, do you have like any regional breakdown? Uh, uh, we don't. Um, uh, we're obviously looking uh, in terms of the uh, of a uh, you know uh, uh, we we are primarily a forecaster UK wide, and we're looking at it on that aggregate basis. Uh, when we're producing the the Scottish specific forecast, obviously the SFC is taking a more bottom up approach based on their particular analysis of the Scottish uh, uh, economic determinants, uh, whereas we would be looking more at the the UK-wide picture uh, and what the Scottish share would be and whether there are particular factors that would be would be moving that around. So I think one consistent reason to uh, to help explain why the Scottish, why the SFC's forecast for Scottish income tax would be somewhat uh, different from ours, weaker than ours, would be that difference in them taking account of, uh, of weaker uh, expected earnings growth in Scotland. Okay. Um, I'm also just interested in your, your view going ahead in terms of average hours worked. Um, you know, to give a bit of context, um, certainly in the area I represent, there's a concern that you know because people's wage levels are, are low, they sometimes have to do two and three jobs and, and therefore are having to work longer hours. Um, is that something that, in, in terms of looking ahead, is that something that you're seen in your forecasts that people are having to work longer hours? This, I think, is somewhere where the, da where the data over the last few quarters has been quite, you know, uh, uh, has been quite volatile and therefore actually distilling a longer term picture out of that was difficult. I think we would some way back have assumed that, look, average hours are on a generally, you know, quite long standing downward trend. But in the light of recent data, you might assume that that's flatter for the time being. So uh, uh, at that level, you'd see that. But I think one would be slightly wary of looking too much at the quarter on quarter changes on that, say, since the last forecast. It's one of the areas where we would have expected a bounce back from what looked like an erratic number back at the beginning of last year, which, which has turned out to be more persistent in terms of a, a fall again than we'd anticipated. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you, Dr. James. Um, Murdo? 
Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Choate. Um, just looking at the, the overall uh, economic and fiscal picture that you paint, you say that the uh, performance of the real economy has been less impressive relative to expectations. You revised down your projections for real GDP growth in uh, 2018. Yet at the same time as that, we see uh, that uh, there is growing employment, we are seeing uh, wages rising faster than previously expected, and we are seeing uh, an improvement, quite a substantial improvement, in the public finances. So how can we have these positive outcomes when GDP growth has uh, been worse than we previously expected? Um, I think that in terms of the calendar year GDP growth rate, it wasn't that much weaker than, than anticipated, and most people were looking at something in the 1% to 1.5% territory and that's 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 proved uh, you know broadly in the right ballpark there was the particular issue last year of a weak first quarter because of the uh, the weather uh, and the way in which you cal you, you calculate a year-on-year -year growth rate what goes on in the quarters immediately before and after the turn of the year has a disproportionate effect on the numbers than if you get a surprise in the fourth quarter of the year so there's there's an element of that so I wouldn't overstate that I think one we, we were struck um, in as the numbers were evolving through last year that you were seeing uh, most of the major tax streams, so not just one of them, kicking in considerably more money than was anticipated through the, this period. So there, there seemed to be something more general going on. So one possibility that we raised in the uh, in the uh, for, in the uh, forecast report that we did back in October was the possibility that not necessarily real GDP growth, but that nominal GDP growth, the cash size of the economy, may have been growing more quickly than the official figures were suggesting at the time. Because if you're thinking about tax revenues coming in, it's it's the nominal we we tax away a proportion of people's cash income and spending, uh, not a proportion of what the statisticians choose to regard as real growth versus changes in prices. And I think in the latest set of numbers that the ONS has produced in the last couple of, uh, in the last few days, they have indeed revised up their estimate of how quickly the cash size of the economy was growing through 2017, which would be consistent with that part of the, uh, of the story. Uh, so. Um, uh, that said, there were a number of other features, for example, in, in the, on the income tax side, where there were positive surprises in 2018-19 in the, in the strength of those receipts that you wouldn't expect for it to push through into future years and which we didn't push through into future years of the forecast. Among those uh, policy changes, things like PAYE refresh, which is trying to sort of capture underpayment of income tax earlier, that has the effect of bringing forward receipts, and so you get more of them in the near term, but it doesn't actually increase the, the strength over the, uh, uh, over the uh, longer term. Uh, I think, as you say, within the, within the composition of GDP, you also had a stronger employment growth over the summer than people anticipated, so that would be an element of it as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Lord, uh, thank you. Um, Adam. Um, you just got Murdo and Adam confused, didn't you? I did. Um, <coughs> it's very difficult to do that, of course. But I did manage it. Um, uh, I'm afraid I want to ask about Brexit. Um, uh, so this um, forecast was published in October, which was before the um, publication of the withdrawal agreement. Um, uh, and you uh, say in this forecast that at that point there was no meaningful basis to predict the outcome of what were then current negotiations. But of course, there is now a, meaning, a meaningful basis, and in, in, and in particular, there's a meaningful basis to analyse the um, like the economic differences between this deal being accepted and the alternative to this deal being accepted, which is that the United Kingdom would be likely to leave the European Union on a no-deal basis. So, could you help the committee understand what the difference is from the from your perspective between the deal that's on the table and a no-deal Brexit? Uh, we haven't done a direct comparison of those two. We set out in a paper uh, last year the, the, the thinking that we would go through in terms of analysing what the eventual outcome is. In terms of policy, it should be, it's important to state that although we are required by legislation to base our forecasts on current government policy, that we and they interpret as policy that is in the government's hands to... Uh, deliver and ensure is is in place there. So obviously there is still doubt about where we are going to be at the end point. And as you exactly point out, uh, you know it could be on the basis of that agreement on something else, 
on uh, some uh, uh, delay in the process uh, or on the possibility of a of a no uh, deal exit. I think in terms of thinking about what the impact of a no deal exit might be, what you have had was a sort of useful analysis from the Bank of England towards the end of last year. Uh, they produced some assessments that were, on the one hand, uh, pointed to some of the differences in uh, essentially their view of the growth prospects that result from, in the long term, greater or lesser continued engagement with the EU and closeness in terms of, of trading relationships. But then they also produced a couple of scenarios uh, based on a you know disorderly or a disruptive uh, exit, uh, not uh, they were very clear. Although you know, needless to say, everybody leaps to the the most uh, uh, interesting uh, of the uh, the sets of numbers that they produced. They said, look, these are, in a sense, scenarios used for stress testing the health of the financial sector under these circumstances. Not a specific forecast, and in, and particularly that their uh, their worst case scenario was a worst case scenario not a central forecast of what would happen uh, under the circumstances of no deal. If you look at the, the paths that they, they set out there, I, I think a couple of things are striking. First of all, you know, a disruptive ex exit would be an un, you know, a very unusual sort of shock to hit the UK economy uh, for which there is not good precedent in this country or indeed in other countries that economists would normally draw upon in saying, well, what are the closest examples of this that you can see in the past and draw conclusions from that? It would be a, in all probability, a simultaneous uh, negative or a damaging shock both to demand in the economy, to the willingness of consumers and businesses to spend, and simultaneously, and particularly importantly, to the supply capacity of the economy, the ability of the economy to produce goods and services and get them uh, and get them uh, distributed, and as I say, looking back to instances where you have have seen that in the past is, is quite hard. My colleague uh, Charlie Bean, uh, in evidence to your Westminster counterparts, highlighted you know the three day week as you know one example of where you've had the sort of relatively abrupt uh, quantity constraints on what the economy is is doing there. In terms of the f the fiscal implications of that. You know, there is the uncertainty around how big the initial hit is, and I think in the Bank of England's analysis, there are two scenarios. And as I say, this this wasn't a you know a distribution of the of you know around a particular set of probabilities was a near term hit of three percent or a near term hit of eight uh, percent to GDP. There's obviously uncertainty about how big that would be, but key in terms of the fiscal implications is how persistent that effect would be. Clearly, it is much more of a concern for somebody thinking about long-term fiscal uh, planning and long-term public expenditure if you think that that sort of uh, shock would have a long-lasting effect, i.e. it would just move the economy down to a permanently, significantly lower trend path of activity than you would otherwise expect, or whether you have a really kind of a really bad six months, it goes down, it then bounces back, not all the way back to where you would have started, and, and that's and that's the basis. And so there are those two neither of those judgments is an easy one to base. As Susan said, it would depend a lot on exactly what the nature of the disruptions was, the nature of the mitigating measures that the UK government was able to take, the attitude that other EU countries uh, took. The uh, uh, you know how how accommodating they were of those sort of of, uh, of of constraints as they come up, but I think and and this was interesting in the in the discussion with uh, Ms. Constance about the you know when will when will we know, um, and obviously you know we are in the, we would be in the process of having to produce a forecast and if we have to do it on the basis of a of a no deal outcome as a central expectation we try to do that. What I would warn you about is that even when you start to get the outturn data, not the forecast, but what the ONS and other people tell you about what was happening through that process, it's going to be the very, very early drafts of economic history and you know the initial indications of what has happened to the economy over a one, two, three quarter period uh, may look very different with the passage of time. Uh, I think we'll certainly pop into the next forecast. I looked back at the... Uh, the different, you know, the range over the last 25 years of what the ONS thought happened in the first quarter of the three-day week. And, you know, the outturn estimates, not the forecast, varied from it hit the economy by 3% to it hit the economy by 1%. And 
you know, the numbers were changing on that years after the event. So the caution I would have is the idea that even if we do enter into this process, you have the uncertainties around, as I say, forecasting in the near term what the hit is going to be, how persistent it would be. The other challenge would be is I will be coming back to you in a year's time and saying, well, this is what the outturn data is showing at the moment, but we need to be putting an enormous amount of you know, dollop of salt on this as whether this is you know, the same picture that the official statistics are going to be painting uh, in a few years' uh, time. That that, that's helpful, thanks, and, and, and slightly anticipates what, what my supplementary was, was going to be, which, which is this, that you say um, in your uh, forecast from October, and I quote, that a disorderly Brexit, by which I assume you mean a no-deal Brexit, um, uh, would have severe short-term implications for the economy, the exchange rate, asset prices, and the public finances. Now, when you wrote that, you didn't have anything to compare a no-deal scenario with, but you now do. Um, because we have a comprehensive 585-page withdrawal agreement which has been in the public domain for a, a number of weeks now. Is there anything that you could tell us um, as to how much more severe um, the implications for the economy, the exchange rate, asset prices and public finances a no-deal Brexit would be when compared with the withdrawal agreement? Uh not really, because I think, as I say, the, the degree of uncertainty around what the what the no deal scenario would look like is considerable. In terms, I think, as this coming up in the last situation, it's not clear that the withdrawal agreement, were that to, to pass through, would be an outcome that lies outside the range of possibilities that is effectively incorporated in the forecast that we that we have at the moment. Um, obviously, a lot of the you know the interest in the in the in the in in where we end up with this uh, are effects that the uh, not just the withdrawal agreement but you know the the end state trade relationship we end up with the long term migration policy we end up with will be things that will yeah. have an effect over a far longer horizon uh, than the five years that we're looking at. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I I, I, I understand that, but the um, uh, you know the, in in the very short term. Um, uh, politicians have a decision to make, and they have a decision to make about whether to back the deal that's on the table or, or not. And, and, and you have very helpfully said that the consequences of a disorderly um, Brexit will be severe in the short term for the economy, the exchange rate, for asset prices, and for public finances. We, we now have something to compare that scenario with, and it would be helpful, I think, if you could um, assist us in understanding the magnitude of the difference between the deal that's on the table, um, and the alternative to the deal that's on the table, which is as the law stands, that we leave the European Union on the 29th of March with no deal. Uh, it, and and it, it, how, much, how much assistance can you give us uh, on, on that very specific Well, I, I can reiterate the point that a, that a disruptive outcome would be a lot worse than one that is not a disruptive outcome. If you, you know, at the moment, we are, the, the forecast is predicated, ours and the SFC, on a not you know, on a non-disruptive outcome, and, that, and the withdrawal agreement would be something that is consistent with the range of possibilities that is taken into account on that basis. The greater uncertainty is, you know, how far is is not the, the the bigger uncertainty is not the difference between what either of us are assuming now and what you would assume if the withdrawal agreement went through completely. It's the difference between what we're assuming now and the wide range of different possibilities that a, that a, that a disruptive exit could, could look like. And I think it is important to draw the distinction between a no deal that leads you nonetheless in a relatively orderly way to a sort of relatively distant trading relationship with the EU on a WTO scenario versus the sort of exit that implies, you know, you know severe near-term supply constraints, you know, the queues on, mo queues on motorways uh, type scenario, uh, that's, a, that's a very different uh, uh, situation. And as I say, we do not have uh, good historical precedents to be able to, to draw on with that. And you don't know until you get there, as I say, what mitigating measures it would be possible to take, what measures will be taken on the other side of the channel uh, to put that there. But, you know, the summary is a disruptive outcome would be worse than a less disruptive outcome, and people should certainly take and, that into and, account. And, and the other take-home message from that is that backing the deal avoids these short-term severe economic implications <laughs> that you've identified. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, as you know, that was not a uh, recommendation as to how people should vote one way or the other, which is yeah, way, ab I, way above my pay grade. <laughs> but it's also very helpful. Once a deal falls next week, it makes sure that there's not going to be any situation where there's no deal. <laughs> 
But Angela, I think you had a supplementary. I've got a few supplementaries, uh, convener. I, I think it's very interesting um, that a lot of the experts in front of us uh, talk about a disruptive Brexit or a disorderly Brexit um, and don't actually use the phrase uh, no deal Brexit. And I wonder whether that's, you know, because all Brexit is on a, a spectrum of uh, d disruption. And I thought it was interesting that you were talking about more or less disruption. There is nothing about this process that isn't uh, disruptive um, or indeed uh, damaging. But I wondered, you, you said earlier that uh, you spoke about, you know, reducing demand in the economy uh, and a disruptive effect to supply of goods and services over on top of, you know, the potential risks to exchange rate, asset prices, public finances. I just wondered if you could um, maybe put some of that in human speak, what this means for, you know, ordinary people going about you know, their, 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 their daily life? I mean, are we looking at, you know, food shortages? Are we looking at, you know, three-day week queues, queues in the motorway? You know, what, what will this mean in real life? I mean, I, I this is not the... the uh, uh, I can do no more than point you at the sort of analysis that you would have seen out of the Bank of, uh, of England and other institutions. It's the, the, the nature of those sorts of, uh, of disruptions is, is, uh, is not part of our remit. But exactly, the sorts of things you're talking about are disruptions to the ability of the economy uh, to produce goods and services, to get them distributed. That's obviously uh, something that would clearly have an impact on daily lives as well as on, on you know, relatively abstract uh, economic statistics, but it's another reason why turning that into a quantitative estimate of what this is going to mean in terms of the way in which the ONS measures the amount of value added in the economy from one quarter to the next uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a very difficult one. The other issue, of course, is that we don't know how policy would respond to those, to those sort of events. The Bank of England has spoken quite a lot about... Uh, the challenges they would face. It's not like their response to the referendum vote when you know it was you know they perceived it as being a blow to people's confidence, their willingness to spend, and that the bank could therefore come in and, and buoy that by what they did on uh, on interest rates and other uh, monetary support for the economy. What well, they've pointed out that if you hit, if you're hit by a shock, which is you know people's ability to get work, people's ability to get the products that their businesses produce to their customers. Uh, that's a that's a very different sort of of economic blow, and not one to which the automatic policy response is to take measures that m that encourage people to spend more. Okay, um, looking at your executive summary in paragraph one point sixteen, uh, you spoke of um, how the economy has already been weakened uh, as a result of the Brexit vote or the, the EU referendum. You know, uh, in terms of the pound being squeezed and the impact that's had on household incomes and consumptions, and how um, business investment has been dampened, uh, could you speak a bit more about how this has already hurt our economy and the implications of that? Uh, yes, I mean that, that's that's the conclusion that we and I think most other people have reached. The, the, the classic problem here, of course, is that we cannot know with confidence what the world would have looked like had that vote. Uh, never taken uh, place. The, uh, you can think about the way in which we've tried to quantify this effect in a couple of ways, one of which is, you know, we had a forecast prior to the referendum assuming that the, uh, that the UK would remain in the, or that there would be a vote to remain in the EU, and we forecast, roughly speaking, that the economy would grow by about 4.5% between the time of the referendum and now. And in the first forecast that we produced after the referendum, we reduced that to about 3%. And I think that the latest outturn data suggests that growth has been around 3.2%. So that's consistent. You know, it's not a spot the ball competition. The numbers can be revised and, and look different, but it's consistent in that picture. The other, the other way that people try to approach this task is to... Uh, it's. Uh, you, you try to identify by looking at the behaviour of other economies relative to the UK, 
uh, you try to identify what you might think of as a doppelganger economy for the UK. So you have a sort of, you know, you know let's say a different proportions of, you know, the UK typically grows and performs 40% like France, 10% like Hungary or whatever basket of countries that you do to put that together. And then you can look at how that basket of countries has continued to perform after the referendum and compare it with how the UK has actually performed mm -hmm. after the referendum. And that gives you a rough picture of what you might think that the UK would have been doing had the vote not gone that way. Now, I think I can think of two or three uh, economists or, or analytical groups that have done that sort of analysis, and they tend to suggest that the economy is about one and a half to two and a half percent smaller than it otherwise. Uh, would have been. And that, again, is consistent with this picture, particularly of the, the weak, relative weakness of business investment in the wake of the, uh, of the referendum, the fact that the boost to net trade from the fall in the exchange rate has not been as great as some people would have anticipated. But there's clearly an enormous amount of un uncertainty around that. But the fact that you have numbers of that magnitude is broadly consistent, again, with the changes in our forecast picture and the fact that... Uh, you had the world economy doing better than you would have anticipated in the immediate period after the referendum than was anticipated beforehand. So in a sense, we should have, we should have outperformed pre-referendum expectations as a result purely of that better global scenario, but that didn't happen. So it's, it's a broad picture. It does look as though it's, the economy is weaker than it otherwise would have been, but you shouldn't, you know... The, the precise magnitude is, is clouded by considerable uncertainty. So, so looking at what's going to happen next, and the World Bank had some you know, interesting analysis today about Brexit and obviously uh, what's happening with uh, China and the US and, and, and trade sanctions um, is, is well. So looking to the future in terms of what happens next, um, you know, none of it looks good. Um, and you've spoke about how um, you assess the, the, the change in circumstances as they become apparent. But what I'm particularly interested in is the impact on the tax take and other consequences um, of Brexit, and particularly in relation to migration. We've discussed it this morning already um, in terms of current UK proposals that are being consulted on in terms of the white paper. This would reduce, you know, our working age population because EU migration could potentially reduce by 80%. Uh, uh, that will have an impact on uh, real GDP uh, in Scotland by 6.8% by 2040 and will reduce revenues over the period uh, by, by £2 billion. So I, I wonder, you know, what analysis um, have you done today and, you know, how changes in migration and tax take will potentially inform the, the future work that you'll do? Uh, well, b before the Brexit issue came along, we already, of course, have to make some sort of, take some sort of account in all our forecasts of what the prospective outlook for the population is, which is, you know, crucially uh, affected by by, uh, by migration flows, but is also affected by other things uh, as well, uh, mortality, longevity, uh, etc. And uh, again, the sort of the big picture conclusion is over a sort of, you know, uh, a, a medium to longish uh, horizon, that lower net inward migration is a net negative for the public finances, primarily because inward migrants are more likely to be of working age than the population uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, and you know, we have, we, from time to time, we basically have to decide from the available um, population projections that the Office for National Statistics uh, produces which ones we should base our forecast on. When the referendum came along, if the vote had not gone the way that it did, I think we would have been inclined on the basis of what were then recent outturn data to have moved to assuming a higher flow of net inward migration simply because it had been higher than the official projections had suggested in the past. And the judgment that we took in, uh, in November 2016 was to stick with the principal population projection rather than adopting one which would have gone to a higher, uh, a higher net inward migration flows. And that, as we set out in that forecast, you know, has a, an impact on you know, weaker uh, growth in incomes and, and profits and spending and therefore a uh, weaker position on the, uh, on the public finances. Now, in terms of when we, when we get down to a sort of you know, firm 
position on what the future migration policy will be, you need to take into account not just what that means for the volume of the flows, but also the composition of them. So the, uh, the forecasts that we have done to date have been based on the relatively simple um, assumption, consistent in broad terms with uh, the available evidence, that the characteristics of a net migrant in terms of their likely productivity, their likely employment prospects, are the same adjusted for wage and gender as they would be for the, the, the native domestic uh, uh, population. One thing that we would have to do in the event of that sort of change in migration policy is to argue, is to ask ourselves whether it was sufficient that we should assume that, you know, the, the post policy change net migration flow would have a different, uh, higher productivity consequence than the, uh, than the, uh, than, uh, than the existing population. I suspect that if we end up going down that path, given that we're talking here about you know, the flows in and not the stock of people in the country at the moment, the quantitative effects would probably be relatively modest. But obviously, the implications of changes in migration, as you discussed uh, earlier on, in particular areas, in particular industries, could be more significant than the aggregate picture. But of the yeah, aggregate so, picture, so, so, so in a Scottish, I doubt it would be so huge. So in a Scottish context, in terms of you know, our, our population growth is entirely predicated on um, e, e, you know, po positive EU uh, m m migration. Um, and what I would be really keen to, to know is whether you have or whether you will do some very specific analysis on the UK government white paper, migration paper, that was published uh, just you know, over the, the, the Christmas period, um, given that in your executive summary, um, you, go to, you, you take some effort to scope out potential changes on the national living wage, which you know, are going to, there's going to be some form of con consultation on. So, you know, in terms of horizon scanning, you've looked at that particular issue and I'm what you know, specific proposals, and I'm wondering whether you will look in detail at the specific proposals uh, put forward by the UK government on migration, both at a UK level, um, but also at a, the, the implications for Scotland. Uh, well, when, when, you know, if and when the government adopts that and proceeds with that, we would incorporate that uh, in the forecast. Uh, but you've done we work. You've done work on, and, and I, you know, it, it, it's, it's an aside. I think there'd be lots of people who would uh, disagree with paragraph 1.2a in terms of uh, the implications of of increasing the national uh, living wage and what that means for um, employment. You, you've done. Um, work there on a, a, a policy that you know is, is still potentially very vague. Nobody knows whether that will or not happen. So you're saying you haven't done, you know, similar work on the the migration proposals because they've not been adopted. But there's a, a, an actual consultation paper out. Uh, that's a fair point. I think it would be fair to say that the degree of the firmness of the living wage policy was determined relatively late in the process of writing the document. So uh, whether, you know, when we had known the degree of emphasis that was placed on that, whether it would have received the same degree of coverage uh, is an interesting, uh, is an interesting uh, issue. Um, I think then again, again in terms of the, the likely quantitative impact over the course of our forecast horizon, we would take into account, but as I say, the, this issue about whether you can, you know, determine once the policy is implemented, how, with these sorts of areas, and it comes up in areas like welfare reform as well, is you can have a clear, this is the objective, how long is it going to take to implement this? How will the process actually work in management, in practice? Will there be the people uh, in place to ensure that this can be implemented over what period in the time horizon? We've been had our fingers burnt on many occasions on assuming that welfare reforms that are announced will come in on a particular timetable, when in fact it turns out that it takes three times longer to get there. So that would be, uh, in addition to any you know relatively high-level statement of what a future policy might look like, we would want to drill down much more into well, actually, how is this going to be implemented in practice? Um, Patrick. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Sorry to, to keep you on, on Brexit for a little while longer, but one, one last point on this from, from me anyway. Um, 
we all acknowledge that the scale of, of uncertainty and chaos that this, this whole mess has, has created, um, and, and including the, the fact that the House of Commons appears to have majorities against all the specific paths, but as yet no majority in favour of anything specific. But I think it would be incomplete only to ask you, as, as Adam Tompkins did, to compare the withdrawal agreement with a no-deal scenario and, and what the, the, the differences in terms of forecasting would be there. There is the, the potential for a different path to be taken where the, uh, the, the public are asked uh, whether they want to think again and, and cancel Brexit. I obviously wouldn't ask you to comment on the merits of that path, but the possibility exists. If that path was taken, would we simply be in a position of setting aside the range of, of scenarios in terms of economic forecasts and public finances projections, would we simply be setting those aside or would the OBR and I assume the Fiscal Commission as well say, hang on, we need to go back and, and work out from scratch uh, what those forecasts are going to look like uh, in, in a, a no Brexit scenario? Um. I think you know the idea of simply looking back at the last table that you put in a report saying this was what the effect would be going in one direction mm. and just taking it all out again would clearly be too simplistic uh, uh, a way to approach this. A lot, of course, would depend on you know you'd have to make judgments about what implications that uh, a move in that direction would have on business and consumer behaviour. You would see pretty much you know swiftly what scale of reaction there was in financial markets, for example, in the exchange rate, what would be happening on equity prices, uh, et cetera. So, you know, it wouldn't be as simply as, you know, you know, leaf back through the document, find the last set of numbers you put in and hoik them out again. Uh, you would, uh, you're not, you know, it's not like that scene in Dallas where the, get, you know, she gets out of the shower and it was all a dream. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're, still lo nice. you're still located in you're still located in real time, several episodes on in the there drama, I feel that and that you have to start that. writing the script from that point. Yeah. How, how, how long, a, how significant, how long a period would it take to, for that work to be done? To assuming that all of the, the Brexit scenarios are harmful, to figure out what is the the new situation that we'd be in in terms of, of looking at the public finances in the future. Well, in terms of the analysis that we do, we're, we're, we are constrained to produce, the to produce a forecast on the timetable that is dictated by the UK government's choices about when to have mm. fiscal uh, events. Uh, and obviously the choices about when to have them, as you saw last year, can be affected yeah. by the timetable as well. So uh, in a sense, we would be prisoners of the decision of the UK government as to when they wanted to have uh, a, uh, a fiscal event. And... Yeah, how much information there was and how robust it was at the points some way in advance of those events that we have to start closing the forecast down. Okay, thank you. You kind of guessed at the beginning, Robert, a lot of this would be about Brexit. Too. Let me make sure there's no other supplementaries on Brexit before I move on to another area. No, nope, there are none others. Right. Willie, you wanted to raise issues about digital matters. Yeah, thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, hello, Robert. Uh, I see uh, in paragraph 1.41 of your report you talk about the government's intention to introduce a new tax on large digital businesses, digital companies. It was simply an initially to ask you, is there any forecast being made on the value of that and the impact on that? Um, I think at this stage, the, um, the, we, on these levels, we would do no more than produce the policy costing on the basis of the measure that was, that was announced. I think in these sorts of areas, seeing exactly how this crystallises in practice, the issues around exactly which sorts of firms will be affected, what that sort of basis would be is the, is the, is the concrete information that you would need to, to come up with a robust, well, a relatively robust yeah. estimate in this area. But as you can appreciate, this is the sort of thing that once, even when you have firm details, new taxes of this sort are always ones around, you always have a much greater degree of uncertainty around the expectations you would get uh, from receipts from a new measure than you would do around tweaks uh, around an existing one. So, And I think given the, the population of firms that would be likely to be affected by this sort of measure, that would be true in spades uh, on yeah. this occasion. Of course, convenient. It's, it's also connected with the, the broader issue that we're going to be leaving the digital single market the Prime Minister stated that almost a year ago that we'll be leaving the, that part of the market too. Has there been any modelling from then till now about the potential impact of that? Because we, we do know that a number of 
IT companies and wider companies are beginning to move their operations from the UK to Europe, and there's quite an increasing number of them doing that. Has there been any modelling on the impact of that on the tax take for the... We haven't done anything on that sort of sector-specific basis. What I don't know is whether the Treasury analysis that came out at the end of last year, which I think did have more sectoral uh, analysis than, say, the banks did, uh, how much they drilled down onto that sector particularly, but that's where I would point you to uh, on the official side for that. But it's not something that, that, uh, that, we would, uh, that we've done more broadly. Our, our forecasts of corporate tax receipts are as with most of our forecasts, done in a more top-down way than, than building them up from specific sectoral views. Is that something we could get uh, a handle, a hold of, some of that kind of forecasting on the... Well, uh, well uh, we can certainly check if anybody back at the office is aware of other people who've done it. Okay. Uh, you might, I don't know whether people like Oxford Economics who do more, more sector-related... Good. macro or you know in addition to a broad macro forecast do them on a more central basis so it's possible that in the you know in the, in the unofficial sector somebody like that has done more of it so I'll, if anybody's aware of it i can certainly get back to you okay thank you very much you. emma did you still want to ask a question no i'm actually okay thanks yes. okay tom uh, yeah. i just want thank you convener and good morning a similar to the question i asked um sfc earlier on it's about average earnings now the uk as a whole is, is quite an balanced uh, economy compared to some of our um, OECD um, fellow members, uh, particularly with the concentration um, in the southeast of England. Does this create a degree of volatility in trying to calculate and forecast what average earnings will be, given that they will be inflated to some extent by particular sectors, such as financial services in the city of London? Uh, yes, the short, well, in terms of average earnings, I yes. mean, one way you can do that is simply look at the overall amount of labour income, divide it by people, and there you've yes. got an average. In terms of how useful this is to inform what's going on in, the, in your likely path of tax revenues, you are, of course, more, you know, you are interested is, as well in what might be going on in the distribution simply because you're getting, you know, wage growth at the top delivers uh -huh. you bigger increases in tax revenue than wage growth at the bottom. And one of the striking features, if you look at, you know, over the recent years of the degree of, you know, when you're seeing people brought in at the bottom, you're not getting that much more revenues of the growth of self-employment, etc. That's been part of that, uh, that story. One area where... Uh, you might start to see more useful, timely information in this area than we have had available to date is with the HMRC's real-time information mm -hmm. day source, which, you know, will hopefully over time, and, you know, they're bringing more of this into the public domain as they're, as they're happy with the robustness of it. And as I say, I think it's a data source at the moment that both the Commission and we look at but don't you know, bet the farm on, uh, that I think could give you a more granular view of what's going on with, uh, with the, the pace of wage growth at different points uh, in the income uh, distribution. As I think you had in the previous session, the issue about whether some of the growth in, in, you know, in the relative strength of income tax receipts uh, in the rest of the UK may have been down to the fact that you were having more rapid growth at the top, that's certainly a plausible path. Uh, but uh, that RTI data over time may be the best thing that we can draw. Do you have a sense of when that RTI data will start to become available? I'm thinking ahead of to the uh, renegotiations of the fiscal framework that will occur within the next few years, because clearly, obviously, with the block grant adjustment mechanism, the uh, forecast for income tax take in the rest of the UK, as it will be England and Northern Ireland, in a few years' time, have a, a significant bearing upon the money at uh, the disposal of the Scottish Government. And I think it would be keen to get an understanding, because London is such a, a, a unique city. It's effectively a city-state in itself, bolted on to a sort of above-average European economy. And I think it creates quite a distorted picture. So I just wonder if that RTI information in that more granular detail will be available within the next few years to inform the deliberations that go on between the Scottish and UK government in negotiating the fiscal framework. I think over, over time it will be become more of a... What I'm, what I'm not sure about is the degree to which the, the regional and national uh -huh. breakdowns of that will be, in their mind, robust enough to, okay. to lay particular weight on. And therefore, you know, I can imagine them being happier to put national aggregate uh -huh. numbers out before they were willing to do it at another level, but, but you'd have to ask them. But I think it's, it's, as I say, it's an area where, you know, it's telling us some, you know, some interesting things at the moment, but you would be cautious about placing too much weight on it too early. Ashley, so thank you very much. Can I take you back to the beginning, actually, where, where James asked questions about um, issues to do with tax revenues and growth, etc. So 
According to the, the latest forecast, the gap between Scottish income tax revenues and income tax BG is expected to grow, albeit very slightly, in each of the subsequent year of the forecast period from 2020 21 onwards. But this is despite the fact that Scottish earnings are forecast to grow more slowly than OBR forecasts for the UK. Are you in a position to explain what, that contradiction, Robert? Well, I think this may be down more to, I mean, the, the block grant adjustment is, you know, is again way above my, you know, the, uh, the, the choice of how to calculate that's above my pay grade. I suspect that the fact that we're taking a relatively top-down view based on, you know, more on the UK uh, uh, aggregates and our view of what's going on in the labour market across the UK and then drawing views about the share of receipts that apply to Scotland. Uh, whereas the fiscal commission are focusing, you know, focusing more on their, you know, growing amount of forecasting at a Scotland specific level, and so I think as a, uh, uh, if the diff if the gap you're describing between the BGA and 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 us is a reflective of the gap between our forecast for income tax and the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast of income tax, then that then their relatively weaker view of earnings growth and and uh, uh, and uh, productivity growth probably uh, underlies that. I mean, clearly on the income tax side at the moment, we, we're coming back to the earlier discussion you were having. Uh, we've got this interesting situation of the of the relatively large revision we've had to make of our estimate of the Scottish share as a result of the 1617 outturn data coming in considerably lower than the quote unquote backward looking forecast of that. Clearly, that's an area where we hope that we will have more useful information coming up for the next forecast that we okay. produce in the spring, because we will have the 1617. Uh, hopefully, uh, the 1617 SPI to compare against that outturn data, and you know that will hopefully shed some light on the on some of these starting point issues, and in particular whether the difference between the outturn data for 1617 and the, and what we had inferred from the previous year's SPI is reflected just in the fact that there's a difference between what those two measures are sh are showing versus whether there's a big move between the 1516 SPI and the 1617 SPI that would shed some, you know, sh some light on whether there are issues around, uh, you know, people's behaviour responding in anticipation in the sort of migration and residency issues that you were discussing earlier. I think given that, that debate you had earlier on, one thing I would caution about is <coughs> it's tempting to think of the SPI as a sort of rough stab at, you know, the true share and then the outturn data based on the flagging of taxpayers is the right answer. You know, we cannot be confident yet how long it's going to take for this flagging process to bed in, and therefore whether the, you know, the share that is shown up in the outturn data takes some time to settle down as the HMRC is getting to grips with whether it's got the right people flagged in the right way, uh, you know, will remain a lingering uncertainty for some time. That's very interesting. Could you maybe expand a bit more on why that's proving to be a problem in terms of... Well, we, do, we don't know yet whether that is a problem. It's just, as I say, there, the, the, you know, the, the, there is a danger if you basically, you know, if you conclude from the, the outturn data for 1617 that the, that, the, that the SPI for 1516 must have been wrong in some way. These are both numbers that, you know, which have uncertainties around them. With the SPI, you have all the uncertainties that are related to you know, the fact that it's a sample. It's not looking at the whole population, and therefore, is that representative of the whole population? But with the move to flagging, there is the issue about you know, how are people you know, uh, picking this up, how they're choosing to to uh, to uh, define their their residency and their taxpayer status, and whether that's going to have to take some time to settle down. How much, you know, HMRC is going to feel it has to do to check whether people have given them the right answers. Uh, when we get the SPI for sixteen seventeen, it's obviously going to be interesting to look at whether there's simply a you know. A difference unrelated to behaviour between the, the the postcodes that are in the SPI that you use to identify where people are as taxpayers and what people have told 
uh, HMRC and the outturn date. And that the fact that those are different may not, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are lying or being disingenuous, that it, there may be just be differences there, or people may be responding. So um, we will have useful and interesting information when we get this, which we'll hopefully be able to shed some light on in the spring forecast. And certainly I know commission colleagues will be wanting to look at over the coming year. <coughs> But I would just be slightly hesitant about the view that you know once you you know with the outturn data you're absolutely clear what the what the share is, uh, and uh, uh, you know again it's a, you know well, it that, is an estimate. That's quite helpful. It obviously, means we need to take a much closer look at the SPI numbers when they come out in the spring than maybe previously we would have thought we'd had to do, just to make sure that it's, they're at least both going in the right direction. Yes, I think, well, as I say, looking at those differences will shed some light but not clear up all the answers of what's been going on there. But it's certainly something that, that we will look at, and I know that it's something that the Commission will, will want to look at as well, as, to, as I say, whether, there is a, whether there's just basically a constant wedge between those two sources of information or whether they're moving, you know, moving over time in ways that we need to take account of. Okay, Have any other colleagues got any other supplementaries? In that case, no one else has. Robert, thank you very much for coming along this morning and giving us some of your expertise. It's been very helpful uh, in understanding some of the work you've been undertaking. Not only has it been helpful in terms of the factual information, but you bring humour to these occasions, because I remember the first time you came, you talked about a spot the ball competition, how important that was, uh, how relevant that was to forecasting. And now we have a shower killing with Bobby Ewing. So <laughs> things, uh, things I'll be able to quote all over the place for a long time to come. So thank it's, you very it's much. It's all, yes, it's humour over substance, as I'm afraid all I can offer you. But there we are. Thank and we're you. now moving into to private session. Thank you very much.